Okay, I need to speak in microphone for those online. So good morning, everyone, um, in the room and, and online. I'm Pauline Barrieu, I'm the head of the statistics department here at LSE, and uh, this is a great pleasure to welcome all of you on this uh, PhD Open Day. We have a selection of wonderful colleagues who are coming uh, through the morning to uh, give you more details about the various research streams in the in the department and it's also an opportunity it's very interactive so it's an opportunity for you to to ask questions about the phd program you know how to apply all these things but also about uh you know research interest and and basis and we we very much hope that um this day we'll answer your questions and that at the end you will decide to to apply to to join us in the department so a uh, huge welcome um you will have plenty of opportunity to get croissant and coffee because we have a lot of croissant and coffee outside of the room. And uh, now I'm leaving the floor to um, to one of my colleagues, uh, Milan uh, Vojnovic, who has been a key organizer with Penny Montague. So a big thank you to Penny as well for uh, for the organization of this day. So thank you very much. And Milan, so. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I'll try to do this one. Lovely. Yeah, good morning, everyone. So my name is Milan. I'm a professor with the Department of Statistics. Thanks to Penny for organizing this. So it's an event meant to uh, give us an opportunity to tell you uh, about research, uh, PhD research program, uh, what kind of research we do, and to allow uh, some interaction. So via various elements of the event uh, throughout the day, which I'm going to tell you about. So uh, we have an introduction. So overall, the event is structured such that we have a sequence of presentations in the morning. So where representatives of four research groups that we have are going to give you an overview of uh, research topics covered by those groups and what they do and uh, the faculty members' interests. And we'll, we'll see what, what comes up. I'm going to present one of them. I have no idea what the other colleagues would, would do uh, for this one. Then, uh, following this, I guess there's some uh, lunch break or something, so Penny will know better than me. Uh, then we have a presentation on how to write a research proposal. So one of the, when you apply, or you intend to apply, you need to submit a research proposal, uh, among other uh, things. So uh, we're going to give you maybe some tips in how to go about doing this and so on. So it's an important element of, of an application. So. Uh, hopefully uh, you'll find it useful. Then we have uh, uh, two talks by our alumni, uh, one uh, working currently in academia in Switzerland, a recent graduate, uh, Despoina Macario, and also a recent graduate working in the industry uh, with JP Morgan, David uh, DeSantis. Should we maybe mindful to be people being online? Apologies, I just turned my back. It's a little bit strange setting here. Uh, then, uh, uh, basically, yeah, this is an expanded uh, item in here, so which is about research overviews. As I said, there uh, are four research groups that is going to be presented um, in order data science, then time series and statistical learning, social statistics, and uh, probability and finance. So you see that these are in a way different topics, but also with uh, overlaps. And uh, yeah, you'll see later on our faculty members, many of our faculty members actually in a way, uh, work in more than one group or more than one research area or topic. Uh, the reception, uh, this is for the afternoon. So basically in the morning, we are going to spend in this building. And then in the afternoon, we are going to move to central building uh, just across. Uh, so this will give you also an opportunity to get a, an idea about the space and environment. Uh, LSC campus is really spread around. There are so many buildings and it's very much under development. Uh, so get, you'll get at least some sense what it means to be on LSE campus. Uh, at the reception, the idea is to um, have a more interactive session where uh, there are going to be some research posters presented by our current research for, uh, students and also faculty members. And um, it's a chance to you to approach some faculty members who are going to be present there, PhD students, uh, ask questions and learn about what it means to uh, do a PhD uh, with our department. Uh, right, these are some, I guess, tips on uh, uh, how to go about maybe interactions during these sessions or the Q&A, especially for people who are attending online. 
Uh, so some details about that. And uh, as an intermediate, I guess we have a video to show, a promotional video that was recorded uh, uh, some time ago. So let me just try to find it out. So just to give you an overview about these research areas that I just introduced by now only by title and uh, so that's maybe uh, not, not only research areas, but also about what it means uh, to study at uh, LSC and uh, the study with the Department of Statistics. Uh, let me just try to figure out how to do this. Okay. So I need to find an icon of that somewhere. Uh, maybe it's already trying to help, but let me just try it out. Uh, so if you do the video in here and then I say new play. Uh, open with and then it is the VLC media player and then there is a button. So as a PhD researcher in the statistics department you be working with top academics in your field. Our faculty have received a number of prizes and honours such as the uh, Fellowship of the British Academy, uh, the Louis Bachelier Prize and also various prizes from the Royal Statistical Society. Our faculty have received external funding from UK research councils, as well as major international companies such as uh, Google, Barclays Bank and Meta. Our department has four vibrant research groups in data science, in probability, in finance and insurance, in social statistics and in time series and statistical learning. Each of our faculty and all of our PhD students are members of at least one of these groups. We also provide a range of research seminars and events throughout the year, and we are a key contributor to the LSE's Data Science Institute and its seminar series. We provide bespoke training in the first year of the MPhil PhD program in courses covering machine learning, statistical modeling, data analysis, <coughs> probability, and mathematical <coughs> statistics. In collaboration with other London University partners, we offer optional training opportunities to supplement your learning throughout your PhD journey in the London Graduate School for Mathematical Finance and the London Taught Course Centre for Students in Mathematical Sciences. A number of four-year scholarships are available covering tuition fees and maintenance stipend, including the statistics scholarship offered by our department. All applications received by the deadline are considered for those scholarships. Please visit our website for further information. Our research students have the opportunity to be graduate teaching assistants or GTAs on various programs within the department. Usually this is undertaken from the second year of a doctoral program, beginning initially with service level teaching on the department's large courses in introductory probability and statistics, thereafter progressing to more advanced courses as one's teaching experience grows. Additionally, you may choose to undertake a postgraduate certificate in higher education, PG Cert HE for short, and this is a must-have for anyone seeking an academic career. Each student is provided with an individual desk and uh, their own computer, which is bespoke to the requirements of the research, and uh, which is uh, located into a dedicated PhD office. So your PhD desk is something like a home within the LSE campus from which you can undertake uh, the research in your PhD. You will also have access to uh, the department stock stationery and of course to the uh, coffee or tea room for that very, very important tea or coffee. Beyond the PhD, our graduate progress onto a exciting career in academia and industry. For example, some of our graduates working at University of Cambridge, University of Brunei, the Nusselum, Guangzhou National University of Education, and of course, LSC. Also, some of our alumni are working at DeepMind, ESSA, City, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and many other organizations. Uh, you have the chance to study in the very center of London with all the collaborative opportunities that provides. We have a vibrant student community and we organize regular social activities and excursions, so everything from trips to the theater to table tennis. But of course, you can take advantage of the fact that you'll be in central London, one of the cultural hubs of the world with everything that has to offer. We are committed to giving our students the best experience possible throughout their PhD journey. For all the reasons mentioned in this video and more, research students in our mathematical sciences category gave us a 100% satisfaction rating in the 2019 and 2021 
postgraduate research experience surveys. This video was useful. I think in my uh, it covers many points, different kinds of points about research topics, about research environment, and uh, many other things. You'll have a chance to uh, learn about these points more throughout the day. Also, if you have questions, you can ask uh, further and, and so on. So, uh, yeah, what follows is basically I'll give you maybe some idea about the program structure, just some more information about this, and then Penny will tell you more about the uh, application process and your know, scholarships and uh, things like this. Uh, so the program is designed such that when you uh, start, you basically uh, become registered as an MPL uh, student in statistics. So what it means that you need to uh, go through some uh, courses. So the first year basically uh, consists of uh, going through some doing some coursework. Uh, the idea is to spend that year uh, learning a little bit about different subjects and there are basically some compulsory and some elective modules, only a few of them. This PhD kind of coursework was introduced recently, so it did not exist back in time. Uh, I think it's a very useful thing, like from my own experience when I studied, uh, we had something like a pre-doc school where we spent a year basically only studying, doing a, just maybe one research was like a research project. So I believe it's very useful to expand the knowledge a little bit, learn more beyond your, your focus area and also gain some uh, new, new skills at, at the PhD level. Uh, so then the idea is at the same time also to do some, uh, initiate some research to get a supervisor, doing some literature review, reading papers, and try to figure out what you're going to do for, for the problem you intend to study. And uh, uh, one may start also writing some early initial results uh, in that year. Uh, a little bit more about this uh, uh, coursework or courses I mentioned, PhD courses. So there are basically two. So one is on statistical modeling and data analysis the, to start with, then probability and mathematical statistics one, and then well, one would choose one out of two. So one being foundations of machine learning, and part two of uh, previously mentioned probability and mathematical statistics. So this uh, choice will be made uh, based on your interests, and there will be some I guess natural choice to make for most of us. There might be also some exceptions in some cases. Uh, um, one may choose something else, some other courses, but this is subject to an approval uh, by the first supervisor and also the PhD program director. So that's about the coursework. In year two, uh, one would uh, continue studying and going more deeply into the research uh, topic and there is a, a formal step uh, to be passed, which is about uh, being upgraded uh, to uh, having a PhD status. So that happens in year two. And then year three is about continuing the research, uh, writing up uh, your thesis or writing up some research papers we may be publishing or submitting and publishing on the way. And then year four finally is focused on writing your thesis and uh, wrapping up and having a, an examination of PhD by that. So that's the overall how, uh, how the PhD, pro, PhD is structured. With this, I guess I'll yeah, give the floor to Penny. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. I'm just going to try and clean up the uh, <coughs> zoom. So, yeah, hi everyone. Um, so, I'm Penny Montague, I'm the Research and Finance Manager in the Department of Statistics. Um, so, a big part of my job is supporting our PhD program and also looking after our PhD students from, um, well, from this point when you're thinking about applying to, you know, all the way through the PhD journey until you hopefully, you know, pass and 
and you get your doctorate. Um, so I'll just show you some. Um, I'll just show you, share some information with you about the application process. So there's a limited number of, of places, so um, it, you're advised to apply as soon as you can, really, as soon as possible, um, not to rush to, you know, submit a, an application, which is, you know, not the best you can make it, but, um, you know, to apply as early in the year as you can. So the application is open every year in October for the following year's entry. So, yeah, last month we opened applications for entry um, in... 2023. Um, and so you're strongly recommended to apply by the end of December to enter the following October. And our next funding deadlines are in January and also April. But to be honest, um, the January deadline, the 13th of January, that's our main deadline. Um, a lot of our applications come in at that point. Uh, and so if possible, um, it, I would advise trying to apply for that, um, that deadline. The second deadline is also um, possible, it's also there, but um, sometimes um, a lot of the um, funding places get um, used up in, in January. Um, sometimes we have some, it depends on really the applications that we get and what the panel feels about the applications. So yeah, if possible, try to go for the 13th of, of January if you're thinking of applying for next year. Um, there is a final deadline um, for, for entry next year, which is in, in May, and that is for people who uh, aren't interested in the um, scholarships and, and are self-funded or have another form of funding outside of LSE. Um, so overall, the um, awards are decided based on merit and research potential. Um, and so um, at that point, Basically, we collect all the, all the applications that are received by the 13th of January, and then we'll have a meeting um, with representatives from each of the research groups to discuss the applications. And then um, at that point, we will award for the statistics scholarship, um, which is um, funded by the department, and also the ESRC awards, which I'll discuss a little bit later and also the first round of the LSE PhD studentships. We have a, an allocation from the school um, and so we can um, nominate people for those scholarships. Um, and if people apply um, in, in April, um, then you can also be considered for the second round of the LSE studentships if, if there are um, spaces available for that. Um, and so these are the details of the scholarships available. Um, so they all cover four years. Um, you may notice that the ESRC um, actually um, the, the pay, they fund three years, but we top it up for, to four years um, because um, most, most students don't complete in, in three years. It's quite a struggle to complete in, in three years. And so we um, LSE topped it up for an extra year um, to make sure that all of our students have a similar um, support for, for um, the scholarship students have a similar level of support. Um, some of you may be uh, undergrads, and so I just wanted to mention the one plus three um, scheme, which is um, funded by ESRC, which can cover the master's degree plus the PhD option. We've got one student who is currently with us who was um, accepted under that scheme, and he, he told me personally that he wouldn't have been able to um, to study the PhD if he hadn't been accepted onto this scheme. So it is a great help um, if if that's the situation you're in. Um, and ESRC students um, receive a, a support grant of 750 a year, which they can spend on books or um, uh, conferences, um, software. Um, so, so that's a great help. Other students um, in the department, non-ESRC funded students, uh, have access to uh, 600 pounds a month, I'm oh, sorry, 600 pounds a year, um, similar um, level of funding. Um, to help them with, with, with their studies. And I also just wanted to mention this new pilot scheme, um, Attaining Comprehensive Equality in Postgraduate Research, um, called AC for short. Um, basically, it's a school initiative which has been part of this year, um, which aims to increase access to um, postgraduate research study for UK um, black and ethnic minority 
candidates. And so if you are a member of that group and you apply, um, as long as you identify yourself in, in that category, then you would be automatically included in the scheme unless you opt out. Um, this means that your application fee would be waived. Um, and there's also a contextualized admissions process uh, in which um, academics would uh, look at your your background, your um, prior studies, your um, your performance to date, and take that into account. We do that anyway, but um, we make a special effort to to, to kind of bring it that way for this. Um, there's also a 15-minute pre-interview session with an academic, um, which is included in this process, and tailored admissions feedback if you're unsuccessful. Um, the department is also um, aiming to implement a, a, a new statistics scholarship for UK BAME um, applicants, which we're hoping to have um, ready for, for this year. If that is um, confirmed for this year, then um, the deadline would likely be in, in April. Uh, are there any questions in the room or on Zoom? Hi, Penny. Hi. Yeah, um, I do receive, I think, three questions um, regarding this. Okay. So, that? yeah, uh, so the first one is that, um, will the recording or the slides be available after the event? Yeah. Yeah, and um, um, another student asked uh, that he or she um, will be handing the master thesis in econometrics in next year, November. But uh, should he or she uh, apply this year or next? Um, so, so he's not going. To, um, he or she is not going to finish until. Yeah, uh, until next year. Yeah. So, um, I, I yeah, if it would be yeah, I, I would say they probably should apply next year, not not this year. Um, I mean, they could in theory. Well, we don't defer places anymore, so it's probably best to apply. Um, for yeah, not this year, but next year. Um, to start the following year because he wouldn't, he or she wouldn't be able to start um, next year if they haven't finished um, the masters. Okay, and um, um, another student. Um, does it mean that all PhD students are not funded by default if they don't qualify for either of these three awards? That's right. Yeah. Um, so if you, if you don't, um, if you unless you have another source of funding, like some people. Um, uh, obtain government funding um, or, or yeah other, other funding sources but um, otherwise uh, if you don't succeed in this, um, in this in these schemes then you wouldn't be funded we, we haven't got enough funding for everybody I'm afraid um, we've only got you know a, a small number of scholarships available and uh, uh, from from a student uh, will we be offered a conditional offer if admitted in PhD program Sorry, what did you repeat that? Um, will we be offered a conditional offer um, if admitted in PhD program? Um, it really depends. Um, depends on your on your if you if you are like say for instance if you're doing a master's um, at the moment you haven't got your um, result then um, we would normally give you a um, conditional offer based on you know passing your master's with a distinction um that, that's a typical offer it could um it could vary depending on your circumstances um or it depends on the situation it's really um but most of the time yes um if you haven't finished the master's yet we would be basing um the offer on on completing your master's uh at a particular level usually a distinction okay um just uh two more but essentially it's asking um how many funding are available and then how to apply for those um, so in terms of the funding, we've got a few, we've got, um, well, um, we've got a number of space of, of scholarships, but um, I'm not able to kind of confirm the numbers at the moment, it may change. Um, and so in terms of how to apply, you apply as normal, you apply for your place, and then um, any, um, all the uh, place, all the applications that are received by the deadline will be automatically included um, in in the process, and, and uh, we will, um, we 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 will, um, you know, we will and we'll look into your application and see if you if you're able to get the scholarship. Okay. And uh, with the there's actually a couple more, but then uh, due to time the time constraint, shall I just take up the last one? Oh, okay. Okay. 
Yeah, so uh, are students with background from medical statistics uh, eligible, assuming that they wish to change the career paths? Maybe this was for you. Uh, yes, to, to a large extent, basically, uh, the research is focused on uh, from met methodology, so methodology and statistics, broadly speaking. So typically, uh, our students do have some quantitative background. I don't believe there is any kind of a formal restriction to consider students with other uh, backgrounds, undergraduate or uh, master degree backgrounds. Uh, but one will get a good sense about whether it makes sense to apply, just maybe looking at uh, research profiles of faculty members, what they do, how that fits with your interests and so on. Is that, you know, for your envisioned uh, research path, uh, is this the right place for you? I guess you can pretty much get a good sense about it yourself. Hope this answers the question. Uh, unless there are any other colleagues that may intervene or whatever. Was Sarah. It, was it a medical certification? Yeah, I mean, I think you've got the, the required background in, in statistics, whether it was medical or another. So it's, a, it's, it's, medical it's not just statistics. statistics. I mean, it doesn't right. have to be statistics, but it's yeah. better if it's statistics. Right. It's easier, I guess, more likely. Plus, we do have people who actually do have interests in certain application areas, including healthcare, and you also run a joint program with a, a health, uh, health policy. policy department. So and Sarah is involved in that and some other colleagues. So. Okay, um, thanks, Milan and Penny. Um, just to show you this, this slide, um, basically to um, show you our website, and if you have any follow up questions after this, um, you can email us at statistics at lse.ac.uk, and we also have our social media accounts that you're welcome to follow. Um, next will be Milan, um, who will give an introduction to the data science research group. <clears throat> Sorry, can I just ask? Um... Because uh, we mentioned some students are undergraduates, but where would you say most do most students have a master's degree or are working on one now or most? Yes, yeah, yes. And then what kind of um, usually in what area are they doing a master's in? Um, we're quite so I guess it's the overall background. So you know, it's maybe something to do with uh, typically like you know some maths degree of some kind or some statistics or maybe degree in physics like broadly speaking like some kind of a quantitative background to, to a large extent mm -hmm. though we are also quite open and we have started being open to people you know for instance uh, with computer science backgrounds given the data science which was introduced a few years back in a department and also other areas so, so. Mm -hmm. I believe in that sense we are quite open and open-minded Sorry, if I lost Do all the scholarships cover full fees for international students also? Yeah. All right. Okay. I guess we'll have time also for you know having questions and trying to address them throughout the day. So uh, yeah, with this basically we start with giving an overview to different research groups, and I'll uh, give, try to give an overview for data science group, and then my colleagues will continue for for the other ones. Uh, to reiterate, uh, there are four research groups, uh, data science, quality in finance, insurance, social statistics, and time series of statistical learning that are going to be presented in some order, maybe not exactly this. Uh, so what is data science group about? So uh, it's a research group that focuses on questions around uh, developing new methodologies for machine learning and statistics uh, with a focus on theoretical foundations and uh, some applications. So there is a strong emphasis on uh, going beyond statistics, so doing machine learning. There is some in intersection with uh, statistics and uh, computer science, so there is also, you can also see that being reflected in backgrounds of our faculty members who are either having maybe statistics backgrounds or some other backgrounds and so on. So this is broadly speaking what our mission is, put very uh, generally. In terms of uh, faculty members, uh, so these are faculty members, uh, they are all except for one uh, full-time uh, employees. 
uh, at different levels of their career uh, with different interests. Uh, an exception, as I said, full-time employee is Moes Raik, who is a uh, visiting professor in practice, who is uh, part of our group, but he works for a company and contributes to our research activities in certain ways, I'll hint uh, later on. Uh, <clears throat> this is a uh, list, hopefully complete, of our current PhD students. Some of them maybe might have even completed by now. I know one actually who actually had her viva last week and see she successfully passed. So it's the current, uh, current list so that grow with time and hopefully some of you will become a member of this uh, uh, community. Uh, you'll have a chance to interact with some of them during the uh, afternoon session. So you'll have, uh, you'll have some research posters and some of them will be present. So you can ask about their experience and uh, what they think about us. So you can, they can maybe give you some more information about their experiences uh, studying at, uh, in our department. So this is a, I guess, usual word cloud. I try to summarize research interests of various colleagues by basically collating uh, uh, little uh, snippets of text where each of them they wrote some kind of they express what their interests are. Uh, so and then instead of showing you maybe some dry text, I try to highlight maybe based on frequency of words what are maybe uh, some common uh, topics. As you can see, there is a. Uh, What's prominent is like in general learning, so which might be uh, referred for some maybe historical reasons as either statistical or machine, and hence statistical and machine is maybe less emphasized than learning, but broadly speaking, there's a lot of machine learning uh, research going on. There is uh, still indeed also quite a bit of inference, so more classical statistics, but uh, topics, but with a focus on computational aspects of statistics and some colleagues have you know, focused on questions like this. You'll find then uh, maybe some typical statistics topics like in high dimensional statistics or um, uh, areas like this, but there's also quite some diversity. If you look into this, for instance, you'll find some uh, uh, kernel. Uh, we have experts in kernel, uh, uh, machine learning, uh, information theory, uh, and then some more top subjects which are perhaps traditionally more subject by computer scientists like uh, in reinforcement learning and different kinds of learning. So, so it's really a mixture of uh, computational statisticians, statisticians and machine learning uh, people. Uh, this is a bipartite graph in which I try to convey who does what and I need to make a disclaimer as a sensitive uh, thing. So it might well be incomplete in both in uh, left nodes and the vertices and the right vertices, but also the edges. The main point to make is that if you look into these topics, and again, they are uh, extracted by, uh, it was me actually who somehow tried to summarize, pick up all these keywords from what people have asserted. On the right hand side, uh, you can see that, oh, sorry, uh, that there's uh, quite some diversity again in uh, you know, the topics like. Uh, some of you might be familiar if you have a statistics background around time series change point detection, but then there are all different kinds of topics like more in studying computer science, like reinforcement learning, there's information theory, multi unbounded optimization, and so it's really a mixture and some more applied maybe around uh, 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 AI and machine learning uh, algorithms applied in healthcare and so on. Uh, one point maybe to make from this is that there is a good coverage of different topics and there's also a good overlap in terms of what uh, colleagues do. So, you know, for some of these topics, you oftentimes more than one faculty member being interested in the topic. If you want to have a more accurate picture, just try to do this yourself. Just look into uh, web pages of uh, faculty members and their express research interests. You may check their uh, research publications either in the list they have provided or going to Google Scholar or maybe DBLP or some sources like this. So, uh, so maybe I'll try to say a few more just be, you know, to go beyond maybe this dry text description of the different topics, so maybe to highlight a few. Broadly speaking, uh, there's research going on in different kinds of learning, so starting with the classical supervised learning where one is given, uh, there's a supervisor who gives me some examples. 
and you need to learn a certain function, say for a classical example would be binary classification, and one needs to le learn a function that maps these points in some space to a label, in the binary classification two labels, but that could be generalized and so on. There's a research going on in this. Uh, then we also do have active research in unsupervised learning methods where one is not given labels, but just some points, and you need to label them or class them in some way. Uh, there's uh, quite some research going, going on in that too. And uh, an active research area, which is something maybe new to our department, uh, we have uh, got some faculty members in a uh, type of learning which is referred to as uh, reinforcement learning, where one is not given uh, data points or examples, but one tries to learn from experience in a sequential way by basically making some certain actions and observing rewards and try to, trying to optimize some long-term rewards. So uh, there is quite some work going on in here. So general problems in this area is that we deal with high dimensional models, so many parameters, uh, complex models, which might be some deep neural nets, uh, neural networks, and there might be generally speaking complex problems, but what that means, for instance, this decision boundary may be something very complicated in a highly dimensional space. Uh, so that might be an instance of a complex problem. So the general scope is trying to come up with new methods, new algorithms, and understand new and the existing ones, basically try to understand what are the fundamental limits of learning. Um, moving forward, just to give you a big picture, so maybe a, uh, a second and last slide on this, to highlight maybe some of the topics that some of our faculty members do. So there is actually work on an interesting area of algorithmic fairness where one is not only interested in accuracy of a classifier or some kind of a machine learning model that we have, but also what is about fairness, how fair an algorithm is with respect to some maybe protected features or sensitive features uh, of individuals or some entities. Uh, there's quite some work going on in our group, but also in other groups on causal inference. So looking at Bayesian network graphical models and understanding like uh, uh, factors that actually determine the outcomes. Also, this being used in the context of algorithmic fairness, you can easily identify some people in our group who actually do work in that area. Kernel methods, as Zoltan and other people, uh, we here were interested in the so-called kernel methods, trying to find uh, good representations or mappings uh, of points uh, from some complex domain, complex decision boundaries into something simpler. Yeah, I'm making a very simple statements, and you can actually check with my colleagues to have something more interesting and more elaborate. Then uh, moving forward, there's uh, quite some work into looking into, uh, generally speaking, like complex data or data with some structure. And maybe a simplest example and easiest to, to consume in a small period of time is basically some kind of a net, think of some kind of a network data, some kind of nodes or vertices connected with edges. This might be motivated by some social network applications or some other applications. And then there are different kinds of questions about maybe inference questions or maybe some generative modeling questions around this and so on. Uh, you'll see maybe some of this work also uh, through the work of some of these areas being covered by the work of our current, current PhD students who are, and are going to present some courses on some overlapping uh, pro or problems in these areas. Uh, there's also some work going on in optimization but focus on kind of optimization for machine learning. So questions like uh, how do we train, uh, how do we efficiently train a machine learning model? Uh, what are the fundamental limits of training, how many epochs or training examples we need so as to learn within some accuracy for different classes of models and so on. And lastly, uh, just maybe to highlight one more topic which is of interest to some of our colleagues, maybe more on the applied side, but also on more fundamental side, is looking into federated or so-called collaborative learning where learning is performed not by a single decision maker or an agent, but there are basically several agents, this might be some servers or some kind of agents, that need to collaborate in a certain way so as to solve a certain machine learning problem. So you'll find maybe one poster basically on this, at least one poster in the afternoon to get maybe some more sense uh, what this means. Uh, uh, yeah, moving forward, I'm not sure about the time, so Penny should tell me, I'm sure I'm already in trouble. Huh? Yeah. 5 to, five to 11 it is. 
Uh-huh. And I have time until when? Until five minutes ago. Ah, all right, all right. So, so then, then I'll try to wrap up. And so yeah, for the, for I, the I be quick, so apologies for this. Uh, quick, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> and not it wasn't an intended. Okay, you can do mine as well. So very, very, very fast forward. So at least I reached like the end slide. Uh, so in terms of applications, we work like in some kind of uh, online uh, platform setting. So we have our work being used by some companies in that area. In healthcare, so a lot of our work is motivated by healthcare precision medicine and uh, Yining and others and Cheng Chun and so on, they work on those, those kinds of things. We also produce uh, uh, some toolboxes which are used by broad research community. There's a toolbox by Zoltan, you can find it on the web. Uh, you, so I won't go through these slides. The point is to make is that we do have a lot of uh, teaching in data science at different uh, levels within the school and we are always keen on having a teaching assistants. So if your PhD students, it's likely that you'll do some teaching because it's good for you to gain some experience, there's plenty of opportunity on that. So I, I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's easy, uh, you can easily find and you can look it up in the slides. Um, these are some collaborations. We do have external ties with industry through capstone projects, MSc data science capstone projects and other means. Uh, so a lot of activity within the uh, department, so like a seminar series, some courses given, this is by a faculty uh, a visiting professor in practice uh, who gave us the um, course of, uh, which lasted for a few days on a specialized topic. Uh, a lot of grants, awards, and again, I'm not going to make, name them. Uh, maybe what I'd like to highlight is that we do have a, a research funded by industry, and these are some examples, and we do have students uh, doing internships in uh, some within with some industrial research graphs. For instance, we had two, I believe, last year uh, uh, who did an internship in Microsoft Research. Uh, publication outlets, both journals and uh, 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 conferences, and publishing conferences just reflects the nature of research in data science, where there's a lot of emphasis on publishing conference papers as opposed to journals, just like maybe to some other communities. And apologies to my colleagues at this point, I'll just stop. Uh, give you the floor and uh, maybe if there's some questions I'll be happy to answer otherwise I'll be around throughout the day so you can approach me anytime. Yeah, anyway, so who is next? Uh, please. I, think I believe. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So actually, it's always uh, good to not to present uh, in, in the first part because I think Milan has already covered a lot of things that I would like to mention. So let me uh, tell you uh, a very quick story by starting uh, by saying actually uh, I was told uh, like uh, a few days ago that I uh, needed to represent my group to, to do this presentation because uh, one of my colleagues couldn't make it I, and I was given a slide. I was given the slides and then I look at the slide and, and realize that uh, it, it has like 30 pages and then I was only given like 20 minutes. So on average, it means that I need to, only, I can only spend like 40 seconds per slide, <laughs> which uh, uh, to make things harder, I understand the audience uh, sitting there. Most of them are interested in doing PhD, which means that there are lots of keywords there, uh, which I really won't have time to, to cover or go into the depth to explain what they are. But nevertheless, I uh, decided, um, like uh, usually what statisticians would do, is just to look at uh, the data here and pick the most important things from, from them, maybe do a PCA or, um, <laughs> or, or maybe uh, use some uh, mental magic uh, uh, methods uh, just to pick a few things that I would like to say, which I think might just be most important for the uh, PhD students uh, or potential PhD uh, applicants here. 
And uh, I think the slides will be made available online afterwards. So for those who are interested, in, you are always very welcome to have a look uh, for the details. Right. So uh, our group is called uh, TSSL, or Time Series and Statistic Learning. But uh, as you uh, probably Milan has already mentioned, there's uh, 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 overlap between what we do and what other uh, research groups uh, in our department um, do. So actually, there's, uh, the group, uh, research groups in our department are not disjoint in terms of their research interests. And actually, as you can see from uh, the members within our group, uh, quite a few of our uh, members also belong to the data science group. Um, so there are nine of us. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, I guess the most important thing for the potential PhD candidates is that um, there are nine of them here. And then if you look at the slides, when I start talking about uh, the individual research highlights, uh, you count how many of them are there. There are six of them. So it means uh, that three are missing. And the reason that they are missing is because they are either on sabbatical or not, uh, 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 um, don't have the capacity to take further uh, PhD students this year. So that might be, uh, that have uh, implications in terms of your PhD application. So that's something that you need to take into account. Uh, in general, for PhD applications, uh, I think Mila will talk about uh, like writing research proposals later this afternoon as well, but it's usually a very good idea to contact your potential PhD supervisor before your application, because the application procedure in UK is very different from the application procedure in US. So here, uh, in order to get admitted, usually uh, it's, uh, the, it's your potential PhD supervisor who has the main say here. So if uh, he or she thinks that you are good enough uh, for doing research under uh, her or uh, his supervision, then probably you will be uh, obviously subject to uh, you know, certain satisfactory uh, performance in your previous degrees. Now, uh, in terms of uh, the research we do, uh, Milan, again, uh, has already mentioned quite a few keywords, but let me just start by saying that we are, uh, as the name suggests, we are mainly interested in um, um, time series and statistic learning. But uh, the reason that we have time series specifically mentioned in the research group name is uh, due to some historical reasons. Uh, but in general, we are kind of interested in uh, developing or looking into the methodology uh, for statistics or data science. Uh, in particular, we are interested, or at least current group members are mainly interested in the theoretical development uh, of uh, those topics. Uh, we do care about applications, but we mainly focus, uh, look at things from a more um, theoretical or methodological perspective. And uh, we uh, develop statistic methods in uh, a few uh, areas like high dimensional influence, dimensional reduction, and uh, there are as you can see, there are quite a few like uh, keywords coming out, like panel, tensor, time series data, uh, dynamic network, uh, spatial temple processes, uh, functional data analysis, functional time series, shape constraint, change points. I mean, there are lots of them. Um, obviously, we don't really, it's not our expectation that you will be able to know what those areas are uh, in this very short period of time, but nevertheless, it's uh, a good idea to look at uh, the profile of potential supervisors, maybe uh, their most recent research work and try to understand uh, at least what those areas are about and try to see whether you will be interested in working with them in the future. Okay. Now, uh, let me uh, then talk about uh, the uh, individual research highlights uh, from various uh, of our group members. Uh, Mona is uh, actually sitting there uh, at the back. So for those who are interested in working with her in the future, you are really, really uh, encouraged to uh, chat with her uh, during the coffee break or at least sometime uh, in, today, in today's session. So her research uh, focuses on developing new methods uh, and understanding and quantifying the dependent structure in data. So you can just think about it uh, as a generalization about uh, the, the quantities like correlation that uh, you've uh, already uh, known about from the past. Uh, and uh, looking into such measures uh, have uh, huge applications in other areas like uh, for doing dimension reduction or uh, doing variable selection and causal inference as well. So uh, Mona also has worked on uh, a lot of other problems, in particular uh, in uh, non-parametric statistics and problems in high dimensions. Uh, she finished 
Uh, she earned her PhD in statistics at Stanford uh, two years ago, and she was a postdoc at ETH Zurich before joining us. So next, I can uh, very briefly talk about my research, uh, mainly spanning three different areas, non-parametric statistics, especially shape and shape methods, uh, change point detection, and computational statistics. So uh, shape constraint estimation or non-parametric statistics, well, shape constraint estimation is a, a sub-area of non-parametric statistics. So essentially, you are thinking about doing estimations uh, without imposing a very restrictive uh, parametric assumptions. Now, this is one example where you are given two-dimensional observations. Well, they are simulated from bivariate normal, and you are uh, trying to estimate the density function, which uh, is one of um, the very important um, important problems in statistics. Instead of assuming that observations are from Gaussian distribution, what you can do is assume that they follow shape constraint. Uh, in particular, the shape constraint that we're looking at now is called a log concavity. And uh, as you can see, um, with uh, this particular shape constraint, you are able to um, um, uh, compute and characterize the maximum likelihood estimator uh, to give you uh, the count uh, to give you uh, the plot or 3D plot of density function uh, like this. Okay. Now, one more example um, to do with shape constraint is this is uh, to do with uh, uh, additive models where you do regression. You assume that one component of uh, the additive function is convex, the other one is concave. And again, you are able to um, produce uh, the uh, regression estimates by simply assuming that you have observations uh, following certain shape constraints. Now, uh, if you think about those constraints like monotonicity, uh, convexity, concavity, they have a huge applications in many different areas like in biology, uh, in economics, finance, and so on and so forth. That's why uh, we uh, study um, the uh, estimation problem uh, in the framework of uh, having to enforce those shape constraints. Uh, change point detection estimation, actually this is something that many of, uh, quite a few of our, our colleagues in, uh, in our research group are interested in. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about um, it uh, in, ver uh, in, very, in a very detailed manner here, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, change point detection uh, later on where I mentioned Tanya's work. Uh, computational statistics, uh, this hopefully is pretty obvious because you are given observations, you say in this example you will need to calculate the MLE, but obviously in order to do the computation you will need to know how things can be done. So it's about solving optimization problems, but sometimes they are not really trivial. In this particular case you are trying to solve a convex optimization problem, but it's not necessarily differentiable, so it involves uh, making use of existing tools and fine-tune uh, those tools in order for things to work. So computational statistics actually is, uh, I think, quite important in terms of uh, making a method you develop to be uh, popular uh, and to be usable by uh, the users. Uh, so this is always uh, something that I'm uh, very interested in. Uh, and I always try to uh, develop uh, appropriate R uh, packages for the methods that we develop uh, from our research. All right. Then uh, talk about uh, uh, research of Clifford. So uh, I think Clifford's current interest, uh, research interest in may, mainly on tensor time series analysis. Now, uh, this is one example of uh, the tensor factor model. So think about a study of a few assumptions where you have three uh, different fuel types, uh, seven different cars and 12 different cities at different time t. So at any time you, you have um, uh, observations, which is three by seven by 12, uh, which uh, can be characterized uh, as an order three tensor. Um, effectively, you are just trying to find ways to uh, decompose your observations in certain manner so that they can be modeled uh, in, in such way, despite given a very complicated data structure here. Now, uh, apart from uh, tensor uh, time series, Clifford also interested in uh, doing high frequency data analysis and uh, to do with uh, spatial economic metrics. Um, so here his uh, current uh, research projects include tensor factor model estimation, including rank estimation, uh, 
uh, unvarying spatial weight matrix in spatial lab models as some primary cancer lab models as well. So again, uh, there are a few keywords there. So it probably is a good idea to uh, maybe Google those keywords and see uh, the relevant uh, papers, at least look at abstract and introductions to see if you're interested in those topics. Uh, many of them have uh, uh, various uh, important applications in practice as well. So uh, then Chen Chen's research, uh, Chen Chen's uh, research can be really characterized by uh, uh, one key phrase, which is uh, reinforcement learning at uh, present. Uh, so uh, he is really an expert in reference and, uh, uh, reinforcement learning nowadays uh, and uh, has uh, looked at uh, the applications of re reinforcement learning in like pre uh, precision medicine, mobile health, uh, and uh, writing uh, shared data um, and uh, uh, so uh, sh he's uh, given a few examples uh, in uh, his slides uh, talking about how to uh, look, uh, look at like uh, uh, data from uh, various different apps uh, to do reinforcement learning okay so uh, his objective is uh, about developing a reinforcement algorithms to learn data adaptive treatment intervene uh, in order to improve um, uh, here uh, uh, the applications in health is to improve the health conditions but uh, there are a few other applications that uh, he mentioned in slides like applications in ride sharing uh, this is to improve uh, the user experience as well because if you think about it, uh, it it's um, it's quite complicated procedure here because you have uh, the rider and you have uh, the driver and then you want to improve both of their experience so uh, the whole area involves um, statistics, computer science, operational research, um, as well as machine learning. So there are lots of things uh, going on together to make the whole thing work. And reinforcement learning is just part of it in, uh, to, to make this whole framework uh, a better user experience. So uh, the topics uh, Chen Chen is interesting, uh, including uh, policy, uh, uh, like learning policy evaluation, uh, A-B testing, or causal inference. So again, a few keywords, uh, have a look uh, to see if you are interested in any of those topics. And the data that uh, he's dealing with typically are uh, high dimension, uh, very massive, and uh, not very nice in a sense that they might be inhomogeneous. Uh, so it requires some data cleaning or data processing as well in order for things to work. Okay, so Tang Yao's research, uh, it's about uh, detecting uh, sparse signals, typically in high dimensional setting. So when you are uh, dealing with high dimensional setting, typically it means that you have uh, the dimensionality of uh, data is higher than the number of observations you have, which impose uh, significant challenges, not only because you won't be able to run uh, the ordinary linear regression there, because the rank of um, the uh, a covariance matrix, if you think about it, it is not full. So, um, so uh, when uh, uh, looking into high dimensional data, uh, Tang Yao is trying to develop methods that can identify, aggregate over a low dimension signal. So, because high dimension problem is intrinsically very difficult to study, so you just want to assume that there are further data structures that you can make use of. Uh, for doing uh, data analysis uh, when dealing with high dimensional data. So uh, a few examples, very nice examples, hopefully that will also show you what change point uh, detection is about. So this is uh, the weekly standardized access uh, death numbers in US states between January 2017 and December 2018. Now, if you look at those figures, uh, you just ask yourself if, if there's anything unusual. Maybe visually it's quite difficult to see but if you do the analysis, you realize that uh, there are certain peaks here at uh, around um, the, uh, at, uh, uh, in, in the, uh, towards the end of uh, 2017. So this is uh, due to the bird flu season in 17 causing a spike in the death number in a few states. So obviously, if you just look at the raw data, you won't be able to tell, but if you have a very uh, uh, nice, uh, appropriate, um, uh, able change point detection method, you will be able to do that. Now, another example is uh, instead of detecting the change, you want to look for the trend. So this is 
uh, a different data set. It's a weekly standardized uh, access death number in US states between uh, January 2017 and December 2020. So now your task is uh, to declare, uh, declare changes as soon as possible because uh, this is when you know there's a disease outbreak. So obviously, if you look at those figures, it shouldn't be very difficult to tell that you have a lot of excess deaths towards the end. Uh, and then this is due to the COVID pandemic. Okay. Uh, so in general, uh, in this area uh, to do with uh, spa signal detection, Tanyao uh, is interesting, uh, ha has uh, done research in topics like sparse PCA, where instead of uh, doing the normal PCA, you want to uh, assume that uh, when you do PCA, the leading eigenvectors of uh, the covariance matrix is sparse. And uh, he's also done research in like, high dimension class three, high dimension change points, and two sample testing. So finally, I'd like to mention uh, the research of uh, Chi, uh, Chi Wei. So uh, Chi Wei's research uh, area mainly include high dimension time series, functional time series, spatial temporal uh, processes, and dynamic network. Now, again, quite a few keywords there. Uh, but uh, the uh, challenge is, uh, uh, I think uh, he, he thinks the main challenge for uh, his research is to do with complex high dimensional data and zero dependence. So you assume uh, dependence in the data and how you model the dependence structure in the data set and uh, the non-stationality of the data and dependence beyond linear correlations. Now, one thing that is quite useful from Chi Wei's slides, uh, I think it also works, uh, it applies to, to um, um, in case you want to work with other super, uh, potential supervisors in our group is that they require you to have solid background in mathematical statistics or mathematics and uh, ideally uh, you want to be uh, creative in developing machine learning, statistic learning methods, algorithms and so that means that uh, you should be good at at least are able to do some complex programming uh, by yourself uh, when, you, uh, when you start a PhD. So uh, Chiwe also has uh, listed uh, a few uh, past and ongoing projects, uh, including uh, ICA or independent component analysis for high dimensional time series, matrix time series, or high dimensional random fields. Uh, also including dimension reduction uh, factor models, uh, as, long, uh, as well as other topics like uh, co-integration for time uh, high dimensional time series. Uh, unit root test, that dynamic uh, network models, uh, clustering, uh, and so on and so forth. As you can see, there's uh, uh, some overlap between uh, the areas of uh, members within our group. So that's pretty much everything that uh, I want to talk about. And that's the end of uh, the, uh, my slide. So um, I will be, I mean, my name is Dr. Sarah Genelletti and I am an associate professor in the social statistics group and I will tell you a little bit about that. But first I wanted to say maybe we want to know what social statistics is. So social statistics, in my opinion, is um, a branch of statistics that tries to answer social science questions using data on and collected by people. And these data are difficult, they're complex, they're multidimensional, they're multivariate, they have bits missing, they have bias, they're contradictory, and often they try and measure sort of higher level concepts like how happy are you or how good are you at something, um, and this makes it like really fun data. And so in order to, um, to analyze this data, we have to come up with lots of interesting methods. And it's like being, in my opinion, this is why I like doing this, it's like being a detective, right? You have these data, you're trying to answer a question, and you have to use all your statistical tools and all your, you know, your methods, and you have to trick the data into answering your questions and telling you the truth about whatever it is. Uh, and for example, some of the questions could be really important, like, is a government policy, is it working, is it actually helping people, or is it, you know, actually more counterproductive, or we've got this new assessment, you know, for SATs, or whatever GCSEs, is it discriminating against certain you know, people in the population because of the kinds of questions it's asking. So it's not just that it's interesting and fun, it can actually have real impact um, <coughs> in the world. So those are the things that I enjoy. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about my colleagues and some of the methods that we're going to be using. <laughs> okay, well, 
This works just fine. No, no, that doesn't work either. Penny. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Next. <laughs> <Got it>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Okay, so this is a bit of an overview of everything that happens in the social statistics department. And part of the reason why there's so much going on is because the data are so diverse and the questions are so diverse that you can't really kind of encapsulate everything that we have to do with one single um, thing. So what kinds of research questions? So, you know, modern social sciences, what, what, how do we answer questions in modern social sciences? And this you know, goes anything from policy decision making to um, trying to understand what, what, what the questionnaire about mental health is telling us about the health of the person and things like that. Um, the question, the methods are basically, can we understand the complex structure of the data? And if we can understand it, then maybe we can extract answers from that. That data. So we have complex structures, multivariate, multi-level, clustered, survival, large-scale item response data, data with missingness, with systematic bias, with high dimensionality. Uh, we want to know about the causal uh, underlying me mechanisms, um, and we have obvious categorical data, and we can also use some machine learning methods. <clears throat> and these are things that you might have seen in some of the other groups, right? Um, and as, as some of my colleagues mentioned, there is there is quite a lot of overlap uh, in terms of the methodologies used. The kinds of models um, that we use, very common in the social statistics group, are the invariable models, mixture random effects models, Gaussian processes, again, machine learning methods, um, marginal modeling, composite likelihood methods, models for dependence, and graphical models. And these are really all models that try and understand if you, a bunch of data, what is, what is what's underneath it, what is the structure, how does it work, how do things relate to one another, right? Because if we can get at that in some way, then maybe we could get at understanding how the process works, how we can impact the process and change it, if that is what we're interested in. <clears throat> and we have applications in the group across a lot of different fields, criminology, demography, education, epidemiology, political science, psychology, social policy, and sociology. Um, and I wouldn't say that we're focused on, a, uh, on applying the work, but we are mostly motivated by real world applications. So there's a question out there that needs answering, how can we go about answering it with data and the methods that we have? So while there's people working in theory, I would say mostly it's methodology, which means, you know, how do you wrestle with the data? You pin it down on the floor and say, okay, tell me. <laughs> this, is how, this is actually how I feel. Maybe my colleagues don't feel that way, but this is how I feel <laughs> about my day to day. It's a fight. Um, so these are the members of the group. <clears throat> Costas, I think, has already appeared in the other two groups. He's really uh, cross, cross, cross disciplinary in a way. So, uh, and be here as well. So we have Professor Rika Bergsma, Professor Fiona Steele, Professor Ian Mustaki, Dr. Yun Chao Chen, me, uh, Dr. Kostas Kalagoropoulos, and Professor, uh, Professor Yanni Kua. Unfortunately, well, good for them, but unfortunately for us, uh, Professor Steele and Professor Kua are currently on sabbatical, so you, you will not be able to have a chat with them. And now I'm just gonna go through each person and apologies if I can't be as you know thorough because we're such a diverse group that I don't necessarily know the very nitty gritty of each person's research uh, <clears throat> interests and uh, and achievements. Um, but I think you might get to meet Vicher later if you hang around uh, for the first presentation as well. So Vicher uh, works in statistical modeling and testing using and producing kernels and empirical Bayes techniques. And he's worked particularly on the I-prime methodology for parametric and non-parametric regression models. Um, and he's really into, into kernels. He thinks they're beautiful. You will see later, I have a quote about it. Uh, graphical models, conditional independence testing, uh, and categorical data analysis, in particular marginal models, which arise when there are nuisance dependencies in the data. And he's developed a test together with someone from the uh, probably the finance insurance group, who we'll hear from next. Um, and so I would say that, that Beaker's work is really about understanding how to talk about the structure that underlies the data and how you can translate it across uh, into, into, other, into other data. So the dependence and independent structures, which are really quite fundamental. I mean, I, I'm assuming you probably understand that now, but I, I, the more I do statistics, the more I understand that these things are pretty fundamental, irrespective of what, um, what, what part statistics you're interested in. Okay, so Professor Steele, um, so the, the kind of the main gist is longitudinal data analysis. That's really one of her key interests. And within that multi-level modeling, survival analysis, um, and simultaneous equation modeling. 
And the thing that I love about her because it's like lots of different really fun applications, which with apparently not that much, um, you know, uh, overlap in terms of the topics, but actually data structures that come from people often have a lot of common elements and you can translate similar methods across them. So demography, residential mobility, union information and dissolution, contraceptive use dynamics and education, the consequence of parental divorce on children's educational outcomes, the impact of school resources on pupil attainment. And some of this, you know, for example, the impact of school resources, is something that you could say, you could, you know, you could do some research on this and then tell the government, look, actually we need to over-resource the school, probably is usually the answer to the question, but you should have evidence that that's what we need to do. Um, family psychology, reciprocal influences between parents and children and sibling interactions. And these are quite things that are quite common. So how do you can start thinking, how do you gather data on it? And then how to start thinking about how you might try and understand how these relationships are, are, are built. So when parents help children or children have parents, how, does, how do you quantify that? How do you measure it? And how do you analyze it? And then in health, child health, mental health, and employment transitions and determinants and consequences of stress amongst nurses. And a lot of these um, questions come from large government databases collected in the UK, like understanding society and things like that. Oops. No. This one. Um, Idini Musaki um, and the next person, Yun Chao, Chen, are both, uh, just to say, in the, in the set, have a little, um, have a, sorry, a group um, that does lots of psychometrics and they have their own website, which is Psychometric Lab. You can't really see it under the, the closed captioning, but um, you, you will be able to see it in the slides. Um, so it's worth having looked at if you're interested in, in this kind of work, which is um, latent analysis, latent variable analysis of some sort. So latent variable modeling for categorical and mixed outcomes. Um, Structural occasion modeling, estimation methods, goodness of fit testing, detection of outliers, and treatment of missing values and dropout and longitudinal studies. <coughs> and again, here I'm talking about large data sets here, um, often to do with educational or psychological questionnaires that are repeated over time. And if we're trying to see what is changing, what matters, what things are factors in how well people do or how well people are feeling, for example. Um, and again, here we're trying to get at underlying concepts that cannot be directly measured necessarily. So you might ask a person how they're feeling in many different kinds of ways. What you actually want to know is how they're feeling, but how do you quantify that? So often these are kind of multiple items um, and they have to be modeled using latent variable modeling. You say, okay, so I have a latent variable in the background somewhere and I'm trying to guess at what it is by asking lots of different questions that relate to it in some way. Okay. And of course, you know, you have lots of questions and you're trying to extract uh, some information. <laughs> and the kinds of areas of applications uh, for Yadini are uh, education, psychiatry, and health. Um, and uh, Dr. Chen is doing statistical and machine learning methods for high dimensional data with noise. So you've kind of probably seen that already. Someone else in the department is doing something similar, but in a different field and maybe from a different point of view. Yeah, so again, there's lots of overlap. Um, in terms of, of the kinds of things that you want to do. And you might be having one supervisor in one group and another supervisor in another group. That's absolutely, that's probably more fun. I mean, <laughs> play them against each other and you know, nobody knows what's going on. <laughs> uh, and he uh, works on the analysis of large scale item response data, again, sort of large scale educational survey analyses. Um, so you can imagine in the States, you get all this data from SATs on an annual level. And here as well, we get this kind of data. What can you do with this kind of data? How can you extract it? Psychological testing, measurement and detection of variant behavior. So again, if you're having, if you, can, if you have a, I guess in a way you're trying to automate a lot of the things. You can't necessarily have a psych evaluation from every single person, but if you can ask them questionnaire, is there a way that you can use the questionnaire to assess whether someone is is an outlier in some way? Um, numerical and stochastic optimization algorithms. That's ways to get at these um, at these underlying structures. <clears throat> measurement and predictive modeling based on dynamic behavioral data, the development of continuous time Gaussian processes and counting process based algorithms to analyze intensive longitudinal data, which are data with many measurements over time collected by smartphone phones and fitness trackers. So, so what you know is, is maybe how, how much are you walking? How much you're on your phone? Can we find out? Can we track this data? Which is basically how often do you check your phone in a day? Like a million times I do. 
So every time you check your phone, are you doing something? What does it mean? Are you accessing your fitness tracker? Are you doing? Yeah, I mean, you probably want to take make sure that you're not, you know, you're not giving your data to Yun Shao, analyze it to do who knows what with it. Um, and then problem solving process data, tracking individuals, you know, solving computer simulated tasks. So maybe a way to understand how well people are doing by how quickly they're solving a, a task over time. And of course, this doesn't have to happen at the same time or in the same place, because if it's online, you know, you can gather this data continuously. Stochastic control of dynamic systems, such as compound decision theory, for sequential hypothesis testing. Whew. Stochastic control, rank aggregation, and change point detection. <clears throat> With applications to online crowdsourcing, item pool quality control in, in, in educational testing. And, damn it, technology enhanced personalized learning, um, which I would like to say more about, but uh, sadly cannot. So please do ask Yun Chao, who will be around later if you would like more details about this. <laughs> then we have Costas, who is um, he's also part of the data science and the TSSL group. Um, he's a Bayesian, yeah. um, and he does machine learning methods for factor analysis, mixture models, Gaussian process regression, sequential learning, and latent stochastic processes, and also developing advanced computational schemes such as MCMC, so Markov chain Monte Carlo methods and sequential Monte Carlo. Um, and his main interest in targeting uh, data that are potentially partial, noisy, and from multiple sources. And the applications include biomedical problems, such as infectious disease outbreaks. I've worked recently with him on something to do with COVID, and financial and econometric time series. <coughs> um, uh, Professor Kuma, uh, he, I mean, both Fiona and Ayana will be back next year, so in time for you know the next round of PhD students. So it's about like that you're not going to get to talk to them today. This is the kind of things you're interested in, then uh, they will be available for that. So um, Professor uh, Kuga is also joined with the Department of Methodology, which is about developing methodologies in the social sciences, and he's a statistician. Uh, and I think there's a political, there's a quite a bent into more the sort of political sciences, although he also does education and, and other things. Um, and he is interested in solving problems in data. So it doesn't really matter to see where the data comes from, provided it presents these problems. Measurement error and misclassification, missing data, and often these are data that have categorical elements or that are survey data. And he does things like latent variable modeling again and structural equation modeling. And I would say he does a bit of cause and inference in there, but I, he, he probably wouldn't want to say it just because he only likes to say things that are completely accurate. Um, applications include the role of education and social class mobility, uh, public attitudes to the police, citizen uh, safety, citizenship, behavior in organizations, problem gambling, intergenerational exchange of family support. This is something that he was working on as well and he's been a member of the analysis team of the broadcasters exit poll for the four most recent UK general elections and anybody here British <laughs> well you know, if you were you'd know how exciting it is well I don't know maybe you wouldn't find it exciting but it's quite exciting because like you know the, the, the we're voting well I'm not because I'm not British so people are voting in the country and everyone's excited what's happening and there's all these polls right so what happens is people go into the booth they vote and on the way out someone asks them you know what they voted for um, and of course people don't have to tell and most people don't but some people do and who says and it's obviously super biased right but you, how can how well you, can you predict the outcome based on the exit poll it's what they call the exit polls and they, they get it wrong half the time but it's really exciting because like they're there and they're updating you and now this other place has counted their votes and and he's part of that team and it's uh, it's good fun i like to, i like to watch it i mean the, the outcomes have been very depressing recently in my opinion obviously <laughs> not everybody else is um but yeah yoni is really uh, part of that team Okay, this is me. So I develop methods for causal inference within the innovation framework. And um, in particular, I'm interested in identifying and estimating effects of interventions in, in quasi experiments like regression discontinuity designs, interrupted time series designs, and developing synthetic controls, maybe and also using negative outcome controls. So these are situations where you know, you're going along a time and then suddenly there's like a policy intervention, like for example, the congestion charge, Probably you guys don't drive, so you may not be aware of this. But you know, if you have owned a car, you can't drive into central London without paying. 
right? So how, how has that, that's for example a policy intervention, how has that maybe changed traffic patterns or maybe also health outcomes within London. So it's these kinds of designs which kind of emulate a trial in a way but aren't really a trial. Can you exploit them to find out you know, whether something has actually impacted an outcome of interest? Um, I'm also interested in fixing or circumventing or tricking the data uh, and adjusting for various problems sort of like selection bias or time varying confounding or informative missingness and things like that. So when the data are missing, but it's not randomly missing, it's kind of linked to the outcome in some way. So how do you find out what the outcome really should have been if you hadn't, uh, if you had seen the real data or the full data. And I do applications in medical things like cholesterol. Um, I've also worked in criminology. So understanding whether introduction of new guidelines for magistrates change the, changes the way in which they sentence people. And I'm working currently on a project which tries to assess broadly the effect of austerity, which again, if you're not British, you probably don't know what it is, on mental health of minority populations in London. So basically, this kind of idea that uh, <clears throat> when things are difficult, you don't spend, you don't do more in government spending, you do less government spending, that's, that's austerity. Um, and also uh, investigating the sensitivity of, uh, of the impact of ethnicity on sentencing outcomes. Because apparently in the judicial system in this country, they still think there's no discrimination. But, um, we'll see about that. <coughs> okay, do I have, well, how much time do I have? Henry? Is that the end? Does anyone have the, the timetable? Because I feel like I've been talking to you. We are running late. Five minutes. We are running, running late. late. Yeah. Okay, well, um, <laughs> just the one, because I asked my colleagues all these really cool questions, and, I, and I, I, I'll just give you this one. So. I asked them all, oh, why are you motivated to work in social science data? And so I have these three quotes. I have tons more, but you can see the slides. So social science data are really varied, and each data set has its own complexities to account for in a data analysis. And I enjoy the challenge of working with different types of data, developing methods that mirror the structure of the data as closely as possible, which I translate as I'm wrestling the data to the ground and making it tell me the truth. <clears throat> There's a chance to address research questions that might that make a change for our lives for the better. Um, and throughout my career, I have been surrounded by social scientists. I have had many enjoyable collaborations with them, both working as a statistician on their projects and using their questions to motivate my own methodological research. Essentially, all my new ideas and statistics have been motivated by applied questions from social scientists. I think that's kind of represented in most people in, in, in our group. Okay, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Any questions? I guess I've been seeing PhD students that are in a collaborative membership between someone from statistics and someone from the social sciences. Yes, I think um, I know Irene worked with someone who's uh, she was second supervisor to someone who worked, I think, in sociology. Yeah, so that, I mean that's definitely a possibility. I don't think you know if if, the, if there was a sufficient statistical content, I don't think that would be a problem, provided that everybody agreed and you know. I mean, that sounds super fun. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, guys, okay, so PhDs are a long slog. You have to be ready for it. It's not for the faint hearted. But it can be really fun, like, really fun. And it can be really depressing sometimes. But mostly, at the end, you know, you, you submit your thesis, you have, yeah, I mean, like, I'm from a previous generation where you had monographs, you submitted, like, not three papers, but, you know, some kind of coherent bound volume, and then you get this nice bound volume, and then you're like, yeah. I don't have to forget about it for the next few years. Okay, thank you. Um, would you like the microphone as well? Yeah, Yeah, just clip it somewhere. Not something that's flapping though, it has to be like... <coughs> Oh, my cup is underneath. No, no, that's fine. I can sit here, but my cup is underneath. Here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here for my talk. It's my a great pleasure to represent the probability in finance and insurance group and to give you a quick introduction about our group. <coughs> so uh, currently our group has nine faculty members and eight PhD students. 
And generally speaking, uh, we are the expert in developing robust and efficient quantitative methods to solve decision making problems in finance and insurance. So these methods often involve stochastic modeling, stochastic analysis, and also numerical simulation tools. So on a really high level, our research is essentially can be devoted in the following four categories, which are um, robust decision making with model uncertainty, valuation of exotic financial derivatives, the analysis of behaviors of multi-agent systems in finance and science, and also the development of uh, stochastic simulation methods and machine learning uh, methods for financial problems. So in the next uh, 10 minutes, I will give you a quick overview about the research interests of each faculty members in our group. And, but I think um, the best way to know the research interests of each individual uh, members is to go to their website and have a quick look about their latest publications. And if you need uh, further information, you can drop them an email. Okay, so let's start. So uh, Pauline, which is sitting there, and I think you already met her in the morning. So uh, she's a professor in our group, and she, uh, her main research interest is to develop robust decision-making methods with model uncertainty. So the classical approach to uh, solve decision-making problem in finance is to describe the underlying environment with a given stochastic models and uh, make decisions based on this given model. So, but in certain scenarios, so this given model may not well describe the underlying financial environment and hence the resulting decision rules can produce a really suboptimal strategies, which you already uh, seen that in the last financial crisis in 2008. So Pauline's research is essentially try to achieve more robust decision making strategies by already taking this model uncertainty into consideration. So we also apply this general methodology to uh, quantitative risk management, in, uh, in particular the insurance linked securities and also environmental economies. So Eric is an associate professor in our group and his uh, research interest is mainly uh, levy process and its application. So uh, levy process is a popular class of stochastic process. And uh, which essentially uh, generalize the well-known uh, Brownian motion, and but uh, essentially can better explain the high detail behavior of the financial market. So this levy process is popularly used in finance and insurance. And for a more concrete application, Eric is essentially interested in optimal stopping problem with levy process, which is partially motivated by pricing and hedging uh, American type of options. So, but in general, Eric has a very diverse research interest and his, uh, interest, uh, uh, his interest in supervising uh, talented and motivated students in a wide range of topics. So you can find a list of uh, thesis topics uh, written by his previous uh, PhD students. And Eric will join us uh, in the lunch and in the afternoon uh, reception. So if you have any uh, further questions, please feel free to approach him uh, for details. So uh, Umut is another professor in our group, and his main research interest is uh, market macrostructure. So market macrostructure essentially studies uh, how the behaviors of different market participants will affect the price formulation of a financial uh, a market. So some fundamental questions of this field uh, include uh, are listed here, which essentially uh, which includes what determines the price and liquidity and trade volume of a particular stock, what motivates uh, the traders to buy private information, and what causes the price volatility of a given stock price. So uh, Umut, uh, broadly speaking, Umut is interested in the theory about Markov process motivated by these uh, applications, but he also developed uh, efficient Monte Carlo methods for uh, solving stochastic differential equations in finance. So um, Angelus is another professor in our group, and his research is mainly interested in point process and its application. So point process is a generalization of the well-known Poisson process, but including uh, more complicated time and spatial structures. So they are widely used in finance and insurance and has a close uh, relation between integer value uh, time series. So another um, um, branch of research interest of uh, Angelus is the evaluation of past dependent financial products. So such as quantile or Parisian options with complicated past dependent structures, 
or ruin probabilities in insurance. So he also developed efficient Monte Carlo estimations for all these uh, um, for the above mentioned problems and more generally for functionals of library process. So uh, Daniela, Daniela is, is here and he, she's kind uh, to come here and support my talk. So, <laughs> so Daniela is uh, research interest is to uh, um, is about a, a risk management with a, a distortion risk measures, which uh, uh, include the commonly used risk measures such as the value at risk or conditional value at risk as special case. So she's interested in developing uh, efficient estimation and the fast computation method by using copter methods, and also its extension to multivariate case with model uncertainty. She also applied these methods to insurance mathematics, such as dynamical pricing under these, uh, these risk measures, and also optimal risk sharing and capital allocations. So uh, an important application of this methodology is to have a dynamic reinsurance price. She has, she's recently working on a new emergency risk like uh, the uh, cyber risk, which is a very important risk uh, faced by MIC, at least. <laughs> and, uh, and Costas is a professor um, uh, in our group, and his main research interest is to construct a financial portfolio with, op with uh, optimal long-term performance. So it turns out uh, such a topic is closely related to the so-called well, uh, well-known and uh, arbitrage principle in finance. And Costas has a very nice uh, monograph on this topic. He also studied uh, similar problems, uh, but uh, with uh, model uncertainty, with also past-dependent portfolio constraints. So besides portfolio theory, uh, Costas is also interested in equilibrium about uh, in the economics, such as risk sharing gains and also market microstructure. And Costas is broadly interested in any stochastic analysis and convex analysis motivated by these problems. So uh, Julia, Julia is a new assistant professor and uh, she joined us this year. Um, so basically she derived a provably convergent deep learning methods by using stochastic analysis. She also developed efficient non-parametric estimation and hypothesis testing for high frequency financial data, which is what you uh, see in this uh, high frequency trading. And she also interests in the equilibrium of the stochastic game with a large number of participants and uh, in particular, their connections with machine learning. So Andres is a uh, assistant professor in our group, and his research interest is um, the behavior about a, a large number of interacting agents in finance and, in, uh, and science. So from the theoretical perspective, uh, Andres analyzed the asymptotic limits of these models as the number of agents tends to infinity by using stochastic analysis tools. And for the more pra practical size, uh, NGS development models to, uh, to use this model to quantify the default risk of interacting banks and also use them to price uh, credit derivatives. So finally, myself, I'm also a system professor uh, in the group. And my recent research interest is about a th uh, theory about uh, reinforcement learning, which is already uh, covered by Yining and uh, Milan. So basically, reinforcement learning is about uh, decision making um, by interacting with some unknown environment. So I'm mainly interested in the theoretical aspect of this method in the sense that how to, uh, how to design uh, provably convergent methods, how to quantify and improve the model efficiency, and how to uh, ensure the robustness and scalability of these methods. So all these questions somehow motivate new developments of stochastic control, non-convex optimization, and also high-dimensional probability. So I also apply this method in finance, such as online insurance pricing and optimal liquidation in, uh, in the trading. Okay. So I hope that uh, by now you already have a good understanding about um, the research interests of our group. And you can, of course, um, find more details uh, uh, on this through this line, and then and if, uh, you are, if you want to know more, please feel free to get in touch. So thank you. Do you have any question? Yes. Um, does your group have any like opportunity to like cooperate with um, some financial institutions? 
Yeah, I think uh, it's a very good question. I think uh, yes, we do. Uh, at least I know Umut is um, uh, working with, so basically Umut work on the market metro structure. And this is uh, particularly important for many um, exchange which uh, uh, they are, uh, have uh, certain problems. And for me, as I work with this, um, uh, this online insurance pricing, and I also work with uh, a big uh, insurance company in the UK, and I really, they want to employ this reinforcement learning method for their pricing system. Thank you. So the next uh, presentation is about how to write a research proposal. Uh, so as you might already kind of uh, understand, writing a research proposal is a serious uh, undertaking. So it's not something easy, I believe. Uh, it's not maybe even something easy for experienced researchers. You, know, you need to write uh, a proposal with some structure it has to be convincing and as we go on, I'll tell you maybe a little bit what it should contain. But the main point is that it's not an easy task. And uh, research proposals are written by scientists at different levels of their career. So for instance, you need to write uh, one, maybe even for admission into an MSc degree program sometimes, like a research statement, or say a PhD program admission like in this case. When you apply for later academic jobs, maybe even for some industrial research labs, you need to write a, a research statement. What is your research agenda, what you plan to do over a period of time and things like this. And then this doesn't stop. Uh, once you also get a job, you still need to continue writing research proposals, for instance, for receiving research grants to fund your research, to have people to work with you and do some, create some activity and some research activity. Uh, writing a good research proposal takes uh, uh, well, requires several elements. Uh, one is having some kind of a new idea and a value proposition. So why is this new idea or problem interesting? Then uh, a research proposal would typically not be just something on its own, but should relate somehow to the universe, to previous work and what has been done. So what's required is to know a little bit about, well, know about the state of the art research. And last but not least, uh, it requires putting some effort into writing so that it is uh, coherent, reads well, and you don't maybe get penalized for this, just the writing style uh, reason. Uh, so this is like put very seriously. I mean, indeed it is a, a serious thing and not, not easy to do. Uh, still, uh, I think it will in, in for you know application to a PhD program addition is a good exercise. It's maybe somehow it forces you maybe to think a little bit, to spend some time on literature, uh, search, research, and try to figure out what I may do at some level of uh, generality and so on, and then try to uh, converge into some more tangible in some way. Uh, <clears throat> so what is the goal? Uh, is really to provide evidence uh, of your ability to undertake independent research and state your research topic as accurately uh, as possible. So undertaking independent research, so once you read a proposal, you can you know, get some understanding of what is the problem, how it relates to existing work and so on, and all of it, that work presumably indeed is done by yourself. So somebody who reads that will get some sense about your research taste, about how you go, go about finding out what is relevant related research and whether you have picked up some good interesting references or maybe some less interesting ones and so on. So it's a one way, it's a component in an assessment of an application. So it really serves uh, that purpose. The other purpose is, is a way to communicate. So it may insist in, uh, say, matchmaking with a potential supervisor. So, for instance, if you have written something mostly by yourself and it, it was written jointly with a research supervisor, that gives a way maybe to somebody who would read this. On the other side, maybe to figure out this kind of relates or maybe related to what I'm interested in, my research interests, and then uh, uh, some interest will be there more generated and hopefully that would result in, in an offer uh, uh, for a PhD position. Uh, so now maybe uh, well, we need to write something. First, how long is that? So basically, in the, you can find information on the web. I believe it says 1500 words. 
and maybe you're very familiar that to you immediately translates to how many pages, I don't know, but for me it wasn't at first sight. So this is like randomly generated text, each word being five characters, which is a tiny bit more, I believe, than average word length in English language. So the document might be a little bit lengthier than this, but roughly about this size. So it's not too much space, I mean, to write. So you need to be economic and be mindful how you structure and how you focus and so that basically you yeah, somehow work within these given physical constraints we have. <clears throat> now these are seven points, maybe uh, one way or seven points that you may try to cover in your research or to give it some structure. I'll go through them one by one in the following slides say a few things, maybe reflect on some of them. On the way, if you have any questions, just feel to interrupt me at, you know, at any point, or you may ask questions later on at the end, entirely up to you. We do have time, so we can go easy. Um, so seven, maybe let's, I'm not going to read them, let's just go one by one. So first of all, is formulate the problem as concisely as possible. So you need to state what your problem is. And it's good that this problem is not just kind of based on some intuition or kind of is not backed up by some prior research or some kind of evidence. This problem is a problem because I maybe, it's, well, the meaning of that references is basically you should look into literature and somehow relate it to what has been done and should be somehow related to something. It's not something you just dreamed up on yourself may be fine if you can do this and if you can convince if it's entirely coming from you. But typically it will be based on some kind of, a, in this context of this in, line, in this line of research or maybe this newly established line of research, uh, people have considered problem X and then you see some maybe interesting aspects of it, something which is unsolved or something that intrigues you and you try to convey, convey about that. Huh? So that's the a problem formulation. So in here, I guess you want to be uh, uh, as concrete as possible in some way, but still keep it at some abstract level. I mean, there's a maybe a balance to be made. If you keep it very general, then may confuse, may place vague, and you, the reader won't be able to see what's going on. If you make it on the other extreme, like very concrete, then maybe you don't want to work at that level, but still work at some level of generality. Or should you should maybe relate it to some, try to relate it to some existing work. Huh? And there are going to be points about that that are uh, related to this later. Then uh, there is this question, so which is uh, precisely what I was alluding to, is the question whether something has been done about this problem. So you need to, in a way, summarize related work. So problem X has been studied by Y, Z, and W, and they have done this and that. So somehow you need to explain whether this problem is solved, or whether people have looked into it on what they have obtained, then there's a question you may think about, which is, why is it a problem? So why is it non-trivial to solve what you propose? Or why it hasn't been solved yet? Uh, must be because there's something difficult or something challenging, or there's a, people struggle somehow to find a solution. You don't want to maybe in a, setting where it hasn't been solved yet because nobody cares, I mean, but that point will come later on. Some <laughs> problems, they have no solutions because problem is not a problem in the sense that uh, people don't care about it. So this is largely maybe about literature related work and explaining why is it not trivial, why is it interesting, in the, maybe at the technical level sort of because things might be also interesting on non-technical level because there are so many use cases and applications and people are interested in this, but maybe solutions are easy. So maybe there's a distinction between the two. So this comes to this point now, which is about why is this an interesting problem? So interestingness may be defined in different ways. So one is importance, maybe there are some motivating applications so there's a need for a solution to a problem in some context or more than one context. Again, in here it's good maybe to appeal to some references and not just maybe use only common sense, you say, I don't know, in the context of 
social economic systems, so online platforms, computer architectures, whatever uh, this problem arises. So that sounds very appealing to many people when you read it, but it's good also to maybe cite references where you know this problem or the solution, some kind of a solution to a problem was considered in a particular application setting. Interestingness might, might also be, but this is maybe related a little bit to the previous point at the technical level, because you know, maybe there exists no theory or some methodology to solve a certain problem and, or maybe you'll try to apply an entirely a methodology or theory that hasn't been applied yet to this particular problem. So that's kind of academic interest or academic curiosity or interest, uh, which is also good to convey. Uh, yeah, so this maybe application settings and so on, you don't maybe want to aim like, you know, sending a rocket to the moon, some uh, companies aspire to something like this, so that's your research labs and some in academia, but you know, there should be some maybe compelling uh, case why something is of, of interest. Um, fourth point is about uh, what are the uh, limitations of existing appro approaches? So this is again related to related work, somehow maybe arguing, well, I'm trying to solve this, but it hasn't been solved yet, so you need to kind of maybe convey that indeed what we can find in public domain say uh, is not providing a solution is not a solution and there are reasons why is this because it has certain limitations or it doesn't apply in this given setting uh, under given assumptions or uh, something like this in this context you also may perhaps uh, discuss kind of challenges that you expect some meaning like maybe um, but why there are limitations uh, and something that limits existing state of the art it must be for a certain reason and, uh, and this is because of some Solution to it. <laughs> anyway, done. Yeah. Anyway, that's me. Uh, right. Oh, so I'm already in number four. There's seven altogether. Hopefully, it's not overwhelming. Uh, all right. Uh, now, when you write a research proposal, somehow you need to maybe, it's not easy, I guess, to fully anticipate what your solution may look like. Because this is a research proposal, it's not you're writing a paper about results that you have already obtained. But when you write a proposal, you still need to have some elements that would hint that maybe you actually have an idea or you know what, how you may approach it. And so it doesn't need to be like a pretty much like, you know, just I'll do this, this and that, and then I'm done. And pretty much anticipate some difficulties, but using this approach, everything will be solved. That's not easy, but somehow you should maybe try to convey what kind of methodology, is it some theory or some kind of a method or something that you would use. Now, this picture, I was just thinking like basically all these points you can find maybe uh, rephrased in some way on the web or in different uh, external and internal resources we have uh, in our school. Uh, I was just trying to attach to all of them, to each of them some kind of a, a picture. This is one that came to my mind. There used to be a a cartoon, this is Professor Balthazar. Anyway, uh, this cartoon, I believe, uh, from Croatia, I grew up in the country, 60s, 70s, it had some international uh, uh, outreach. Uh, this was actually a, an innovator who would actually go around his city and uh, think about, listen to people's problems, and then once the problem would arise, then would go to this magical machine and the machine would just uh, spit out a solution to it. So I hope you won't be going after methodology like this. It's not very scientific. It's like some magic thing. And then every cartoon was pretty much the same thing. Huh? Uh, whatever, somebody needs a shoe. Or it was like very simple problems that he would go to this, type something in, and then this would cook up some solution and that's it. Huh? Uh, anyway, 
Uh, this is a way not how not to do it. Uh, so you need maybe to try to find in literature some kind of a relevant methodology or something that relates to the thing you want to do. And you learn a little bit about, Pro about Professor Balthazar, which is maybe unknown to all of you, but anyway. Uh, now, in, in a research proposal, in general, you need to convince the reader that what you're doing, you try to attempt to do, is new because you're supposed to do an innovative work and not just reproducing what has been done. Otherwise, nobody would fund this stuff, for instance, if this is for a research fund or something like that. So, some kind of a discussion about why it is new, why is it novel, uh, and so on. Uh, yeah, maybe hinting about what kind of a uh, approach is it? Is it about uh, developing a new method, maybe providing some supporting theory, proving some properties, or maybe it's based on more empirical research, like in some areas you might have sense maybe in what was presented today, in some areas uh, there's a focus more on the theory and methodological work, in some is more about applying known methods and finding good methods and applying them and so on. So it depends really uh, on the case. Finally, we have uh, seven, which is uh, maybe briefly commenting on how, some, how this actually relates to you. Uh, what kind of skill set or kind of maybe unique uh, background you have in your prior education or maybe through some other experiences that kind of uh, that equip, equips you with a uh, uh, with a bit of with an ability to solve what actually you have articulated you want to solve. Uh, so that's basically kind of convincing why you're actually a person to be attacking uh, what, what is proposed. Uh, some further tips, maybe obvious ones, like uh, given that I presented all of this, now you may think maybe some of you, I don't know, do I really need to do this? <laughs> Maybe I um, could I skip this point and not submit uh, one. Actually, you do have one, so it's required. So the application must contain a research proposal. So that's like listed on the web, so you'll find it. I'm just uh, uh, copying and pasting it here. Uh, there's also this question, and that was a little bit hinted maybe in the, uh, this morning uh, talks, uh, whether one should solicit feedback from uh, potential supervisors and you're definitely encouraged to do that. Now, uh, different people, different faculty members, they have different styles. Some uh, prefer engaging very closely in writing the research proposal. And maybe that's the only way they would like to, this to be done. On the other hand, you have people who are more relaxed, more flexible. They may leave it to you to do, and then that will be just used as an element in the admission process. So basically, in short, you're encouraged to approach potential supervisors, but bear in mind that different people may uh, respond in different ways. This is just a matter of personal style. And we just can't control that they won't be appropriate to control. Um, all right. So maybe uh, uh, summary points and uh, basically reiterating maybe a few points already made. Uh, well, this proposal is just one element. You know, indeed, you have also so many other elements like your CV, your transcript of grades, and all the other elements. Uh, it's really an opportunity to you to, uh, to force you a little bit, maybe to think about and try to put something coherent in writing based on your own independent research to articulate what you'd like to do. And again, you may consult the uh, potential supervisors, but you know, again, you may get uh, some feedback, uh, some people may engage, some may, but less so and so on. I hope, uh, I don't know, this was not discouraging, I tried really to pose it at first as a, uh, it's a serious undertaking, I believe yes, in the sense that it's not easy to write one to anyone, no matter how experienced you are. Uh, it's just, uh, well, it takes, you, you need to know, you need to have an idea, you have to support it with existing research, has to be Interesting, uh, depends who reads it. On the other hand, you may have somebody who is a theoretician, so cares about under the other theory pretty much only, or you may have some more applied person, so you need to think about to whom you write, 
Uh, so it has to be tailored in a proper way. Um, and I don't know, my personal that, you know, but I'm trying to reflect overall views of the entire department in some way based on my some noisy understanding of what people think, which may be entirely, I don't know, hopefully relate somehow to reality. My personal take is that I do understand it is uh, when I actually consider this myself, that it is a, a challenging task. So one needs to, you know, give it some flexibility when you read. But the key point is somehow you convey, I can do individual research. I've done literature search and I um, carefully well picked uh, some related references and discussed them in my context and so on. I also don't see it again, this is a personal, personal view, is not something that you write and then you commit on doing this for the next four years. <laughs> that would be, I don't know, in my view, that would be a disaster because you need to be a little bit adaptive. You know, four years is a long period of time and one develops and grows as you go on with time and in most cases I guess you will deviate from, from what was initially written in this. Uh, I'm happy actually I managed to fill in my time, so it's 25 with seven points only. <laughs> um, if you have any questions I'll be more than happy to try and answer them, I don't know. I left you speech speechless. I'm not sure it's a good sign. But <laughs> Please, yeah, yeah. Um, so one issue that I've been finding in writing research proposals is managing a good balance of how much literature to include because you do have limited space. What would you say like is probably a good number of fireworks to discuss in, in greater detail before just a few I think maybe I just I just okay straight the answer that comes to my mind maybe for for the main point for the problem maybe basing it on on a few or you know two or a few key references and then other references they may serve the purpose of maybe or providing some context or some background or motivating applications or kind of contextualizing everything but somehow there should be maybe a few. Because if you have some kind of problem in mind, out of all of these references, some would surface out that are kind of really maybe key contributions. You may also look into indeed the credibility of these references in some natural sense and plus maybe recency a little bit, depending on the problem. In some areas, people work on some very old problems and you know use very old references that's perfectly fine and legitimate. In some, it's more kind of fast-paced. So you try to catch up with the existing state of the art, and that typically you have more recent references. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm wondering, should we just mention one specific question in the research proposal, or can we like name a series of, um, I don't know, because I don't have example, maybe a one that is like nested under a general bigger topic. Should, um, like, what should we? Yeah, should be. I believe should be. It yeah, doesn't need to be one, but somehow. Uh, I guess the key is like when you say uh, as accurate as possible, it means that there is some uh, notion of concreteness in some sense. It's fine maybe to have like a general question and then some sub-questions, there's nothing wrong with this as long as it is still focused in some way. That is, you know, maybe you don't want to have like three uh, disparate, totally different kind of questions going in different directions. Again, I don't know, this is just kind of like making you know, best efforts to kind of give you some sensible answers, but you know, I hope I don't regret it after, so <laughs> not easier. Yeah, in absence of any other, I don't know, online, do we have anything or any, is it fine? Or... Again, I mean, we have a chance to meet in the afternoon or during the course of session, you can ask me one by one. No relevant questions. Okay, good. Then with that we conclude and yeah. Yeah. Oh, please, yeah. Yeah, please, please. Yeah. Just uh, realistically, how likely is it that uh, someone's when they start their, once they start their PhD, their research deviates from what they initially proposed? Uh, so I don't know what is like general statistics. In my case, I believe it deviated quite a bit, pretty much it deviated in every single instance. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, uh, yeah, because you start engaging more, working with someone, and then you find, oh, maybe this is more interesting, and so on, you know, it takes some iterations. So it's not easy, I don't know, it would be maybe not also very wise just to stick with whatever was initially proposed, because maybe it's not a good idea to do. 
have to investigate and then we'll Thank you. All right, with this I'm done with my presentation today, nearly. Uh, students who just, well, she just finished um, earlier in the year and she's now uh, an assistant professor. Um, I'm just waiting for her to come on. Um, do you have slides to speak or will you um, talk directly? Um, hello, uh, I would like uh, to speak without slides to, to share my experience and perhaps uh, later on I can ask, uh, I can answer some of the questions to potential students. Um, hello again. My name is Agassi. I'm the and the Are you able to, I know your volume is a bit low. Oh, the volume is low? Sorry. Do you hear me now? No. Maybe some delay, not volume only, echo or delay. No? Maybe some echo. Do you have? Maybe the connecting, that's one of the straight over there. I don't know. Uh, what about now? Do you hear me better? It's okay, yeah. Okay. What do you think? Huh? Oh, okay. I will try to uh, um, speak a little bit more about it. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, as I mentioned, I'm an assistant professor at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland and the visiting fellow at uh, the Department of Statistics at LSC. I have been awarded my PhD in statistics um, from LSC just um, um, a few months ago, back in May. My thesis was about the development and application of uh, statistical learning methods in insurance and finance. I'm very grateful, grateful to have been supervised by uh, Pauline Verrier and Dean Chen, both of whom you have met uh, uh, today. And uh, I have to say that uh, doing a PhD um, in statistics at LSE has been one of the most important milestones in my life, for this I will always feel very lucky. Uh, as a result, I feel very honored to be here with you today and share my experience with you. And I really hope it will help. So, at the end of the talk, I would um, uh, be really happy to answer any questions you may be having with respect to your application. Um, I would like to uh, start maybe to the question why did I decided to do a PhD? So, prior to my PhD, I have been working for multiple years in the long term insurance market. Um, in the area of uh, catastrophe uh, risk modeling. So I have been helping um, insurance underwriters to put a price in, uh, on catastrophe uh, risks. After a couple of years um, doing this job, I felt that I never really had enough time to go deeper into quantitative uh, risk concepts that um, I have been finding them very interesting. And uh, I started feeling an inner need to do research and attempt to give answers to uh, some practical problems I have been uh, uh, seeing um, in, in the industry. And then I thought that it was actually the time to um, uh, do a, a, a PhD. Uh, overall, at my work, I have been fascinating into the area of insurance and securitization. And um, out of um, a personal interest, I have been reading some uh, research papers on this field. Uh, of course, then I came across the papers of uh, Pauline Verrier, who has been my main uh, uh, supervisor. Back then, I did not really know her in person. I know her through her writings, as many other people uh, in uh, this field, this is an expert um, in uh, this field. And I decided to approach her and um, uh, ask her if she would be willing to be my supervisor and therefore. Yes, uh, for me to apply uh, to do the PhD in statistics of uh, uh, the LSC. Uh, with respect to the application process, I found it very straightforward. Uh, actually, uh, I felt that uh, it was uh, um, feasible, something feasible to do at the same time with um, uh, working. So 
Um, it was a smooth process. I wrote uh, the proposal, a personal statement. Um, I submitted, and we have a written uh, my CV in an academic way, and I have uh, submitted everything uh, together with my transcript through the um, uh, electronic system of LSE. So it, it was very um, easy and smooth process, and I did have uh, uh, the uh, support both of uh, Penny and my main supervisor, like for um, uh, throughout uh, um, the process in case I had any questions. Or, uh, how can I write a research proposal as um, uh, it was mentioned earlier? Um, my application then has been considered for um, uh, funding both internally, but at the same time, have been looking for some external funding opportunities with the SRC. Luckily, I had uh, received the scholarship from the Department of Statistics. This has been really great because um, it guaranteed the uh, uh, freedom to do research in any topic, topic I like. So because the scholarship was not really attached to uh, the particular uh, proposal that I had uh, submitted, which I found it very um, uh, important. And I would uh, say that overall, I had really um, loved that the, the whole PhD journey. During the first year, I have been attending classes, capability uh, uh, courses, and the other. Uh, classes um, um, in various areas of uh, uh, statistics. Uh, this helped me to um, uh, bring up uh, my, my, my quantitative uh, uh, skills. At the same time, I have been uh, reading uh, literature on the topic of my interest and discussing um, uh, research ideas together with my main supervisor on a more uh, weekly uh, basis. Uh, towards the end of the first year, I, I found, I, for, I formulated a research uh, problem and um, um, uh, we started uh, looking for uh, data. Uh, then uh, the second uh, year has been uh, more structured because I knew what I have been, what I, I needed uh, to do. I had my topic, I had, uh, I had my data, so I have been experimenting with uh, uh, various um, uh, methodologies. And um, then I found that the area of machine learning was really uh, fascinating. So uh, I have been applying machine learning on uh, uh, some insurance um, uh, uh, data. And um, at this point also, I started uh, speaking with some um, uh, other professors within the department that had expertise uh, in this particular area. Um, it happened like that um, uh, I had a very, very fruitful discussion with uh, uh, Yining Chen that you have uh, met uh, earlier um, uh, today, who he, who, decided, who he accepted to be uh, my second supervisor uh, as well. And then uh, within the second year, uh, from doing my research, I have also started attending some uh, conferences. Uh, both uh, my supervisors and the Department of Statistics uh, are um, uh, very, very supportive in all of the students um, uh, attending academic conferences from a uh, very early uh, stage. This was uh, this type of support was very important uh, to me and I guess to all of uh, uh, other students as well, because uh, if I did not have these uh, academic conferences experiences uh, within my second uh, year of my PhD, uh, then it would have been very difficult given the, pan the, the pandemic hit and then all of the um, uh, conferences have been being done uh, online and this was not really giving enough space to start building an academic network um, from quite early. Then uh, during the third year, like I have been uh, um, submitting already, like uh, I have submitted already my first um, uh, research a paper uh, in one of the academic uh, journals and have been working uh, uh, in another uh, two topics. Um, as it has been mentioned uh, earlier, uh, in the Department of Statistics, the thesis does not really need to be one topic. So this was also the case um, uh, here. So I had three um, research papers in uh, different areas of um, uh, in, the, in different areas of, of insurance. The connecting uh, bit was the um, uh, group of methodology, the, the methods that I, that, that I have uh, been using. 
And then on um, uh, the fourth uh, uh, year, I have been really focusing on uh, policy, my third paper, and at the same time writing um, uh, the this. Uh, I would also like to share with you some tips, let's say, about doing the PhD, something that I I found that it was helpful for me. First of all, uh, keeping a very close contact with my supervisors have been really essential for many uh, reasons. First of all, because this ensures that uh, um, it gives an element of uh, uh, safety and the advice that is provided um, uh, helps somebody to uh, move on with the research much more smoother and it feels also much safer. Uh, at uh, the same time, I think that um, it is uh, very important to um, uh, keep in contact both with what's happening in academia, but also in uh, uh, the industry, uh, because uh, it really it can really help to um, uh, formulate research problems um, better. So the fact that I had uh, working experience before the PhD, and also the fact that I have been keeping in touch both with industry people, but also with um, uh, other academics in academic conferences helped me um, a lot uh, in understanding what was the impact of, of, of my work in, uh, in uh, real life. And uh, overall, I would say that uh, you should just enjoy your PhD because uh, of course there are stages where um, um, things may be more uh, challenging, but um, overall it is, a uh, a real transformative experience, um, both, both because you're, you're learning to, to, to do research, really, but at the same time, you learn some new things about yourself and um, uh, you get new character traits. Um, I, I think that uh, throughout my PhD, I became much more patient and uh, much more structured in the way that I'm thinking. So it has been really a great uh, experience. Uh, not just for professional purposes, but also for from a personal development perspective. Uh, with respect to my, how, when did I start looking for jobs um, uh, for, for my first uh, uh, post PhD job? I started uh, my search six months um, uh, before I submitted uh, my thesis. Uh, I have been, I, I wanted to be in the academic sphere, so I have been looking for academic uh, jobs. Uh, but of course, since uh, this um, uh, field is extremely uh, competitive and I did have uh, um, some uh, um, previous industry experience, I have been exploring both options just um, to make sure that um, I do get a, a position by the end of uh, my PhD. But um, uh, the academic path has been my uh, top uh, priority. So I got to know about the um, position where I'm currently uh, working uh, within uh, a conference. So that's why it is so important that the uh, Department of Statistics has been uh, uh, providing these options for all of us to, to go to uh, international academic conferences. So I got to know about um, um, this um, academic position uh, in one of those conferences, and uh, I knew that the position would open in uh, two to three months' time, so I had uh, some time to, to prepare. Within my preparation, I'm very grateful. Both of my supervisors have um, assisted me a lot in providing me their uh, advice on um, how to prepare for an academic um, uh, interview. So overall, I found that uh, the Department of Statistics have been very uh, supportive environment uh, for um, students to do the, the, their PhD because it was not just um, uh, about uh, supporting uh, the accomplishment of the thesis, but overall the, the environment is um, uh, uh, is, is is very very supportive um, for many other uh, reasons as well. And um, of course, my PhD has helped me because this is what I'm doing for. Uh, my job at the moment is an academic job, so without having a PhD, I would not have been able to uh, have um, uh, this um, position. Uh, and um, again, that's all I had to share uh, with you for now. And I, I would uh, want to hear if you have any questions that I could potentially answer. 
So thank you very much for your attention. And yes, I'm waiting for any questions to have. Uh, do you hear me? Do you have any questions? I do please very well. Uh, I do not really hear there is a network. Could, could somebody come closer, perhaps, to the speaker? Uh, do you do you hear me? Um, I can I cannot really hear you. So if if you have any questions, perhaps somebody could write on the webinar chat. Can you hear us now? Because we kept talking and you couldn't see us and you couldn't hear us too. There is actually one question which is going to be repeated now. All right. Perfect. Please go ahead. Huh? Okay. Sorry about this. <laughs> Um, so, um, it is advisable to um, like choose your uh, academic uh, supervisor or speak to your academic supervisor when writing the research proposals and you're going to work with him or her for the next uh, like four years, right? Um, but, um, um, I mean, the PhD's community will have some uh, feedbacks on which supervisor is good to work with and which is less ideal. Uh, different supervisors have different working styles. And uh, but when your undergrad or master's is coming from a different university, it's very hard to get in touch with those uh, PhD students to get the, the feedback, right? And so I'm I'm just wondering how you choose the supervisor before coming to LSE to make sure that uh, you're working with the suitable person. Very, this is a very good question. To be honest with you, I did not uh, really um, think way when when I was uh, applying for the PhD. As as I mentioned, uh, for me, uh, the supervisor has been the main reason why I had applied for the particular program. So I had an interest in a particular field of study. I have been reading the literature within this uh, field, and uh, I had identified that uh, my main supervisor is an expert in this field. So for me, I did not really think um, what kind of person she could be. But of course, I was very lucky because uh, she's, she's really great. Both the supervisors are, are, are great. Um, so it was just my decision was solely on um, uh, the admiration of the work and thinking the uh, seeing for what um, what type of um, teacher I would like to have to have. Uh, so it it was really based on um, uh, the field of study and not on knowing the person or the working style of the supervisor in advance. Having said that, though, you know, I have been extremely, extremely lucky and some um, supervisors have been uh, really great and the working style was uh, something that really suited my personality. So I don't know if it is, um, if, if it is the only way to, to supervise somebody, like, but um, uh, for my personality, it was very, very important that I had weekly meetings with uh, both my supervisors. And I was feeling that uh, we are working together, even though, of course, um, during the PhD, the student 
needs to do uh, the work. Like the, the, this is the whole point. But um, this close contact um, really um, make me uh, feel that it is kind of teamwork, even though I have to find the way. But um, yes, at least this, is the, the, this was a working style that really worked uh, uh, with me, but it did not really have any other uh, disconsideration in advance. Thank you. Well, if I may, it may be. Uh, I guess you can discuss with a potential supervisor also not only your topic, but maybe probe him or her about the working style, you know, kind of whether you're going to have some weekly regular meetings, which is quite common. You can just basically discuss uh, that. I guess today in the afternoon, you also have a chance to check with our current PhD students and ask them. That's one channel. Stating the obvious, I guess. Um, anyway, um, any other questions? Online? And is there anyone in charge, Penny? Or yeah, no? Each other is online. Uh -huh. and no questions. Good. This way, I thank you very much. And sorry for all the mess, confusion. You're not seeing us, not hearing us. It was. Oh, anyway, <laughs> uh, much appreciated. Huh? Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Penny, what do we do next? Should I close this uh, Zoom session? Yeah, because we have Davide here. Right. Yeah. Oh, no, and no, webinar for no, one. No, no, no. No. no, no, no. <laughs> no. Uh, that's <coughs> um, so we've got a few more minutes, um, but happy day. Are you? Would you like to start early or? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um. Do you? Would you like to stay here? Or would you like to walk up and down? We've got a. One of these mics. Oh, it's fine. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not used to it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, okay. In case you want to do it. Yeah, okay. Busy day, yeah. Would you like to use this one, perhaps? Just take you in here and allow you, allow you to move a little bit. Up to you. At the same time, if you want to be seen, you need to be in front of this. Yeah, it's a bit complicated. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how many is this? So we have people. There we go. We have people, people online or yeah. A few. <laughs> so this is Davide de Santos. He finished earlier this year, wasn't it? Uh, last year. Well, last year. Okay. So uh, yeah, now he's in JP Morgan. We're very proud of him. <laughs> so uh, hi everybody. Uh, as Penny said, I'm Davide. Uh, I was a PhD here until. Uh, last year, I submitted my thesis in 2020, and uh, I graduated. Uh, last year. I graduated last year. Um, as you know, after the PhD, you submit the thesis, and then you have to wait some time for the defense and blah blah blah. All right. So the way I structure this uh, presentation is question and answer. So basically, self-interviewing myself. So hopefully, you can get uh, away with some questions you would like to ask. Uh, a PhD, ex PhD student. So the first questions I'm asking myself is, why have I decided to apply for a PhD? Right. So the main reason why I applied, I decided to apply for a PhD was out of curiosity. I was doing my masters and I felt like, well, this is not enough. I want to know more. Uh, you know, like I have to, I have to continue. You know, there's a really genuine interest in, in going forward, and especially study subjects that were not really covered during the the masters. So, for example, I got really into the course of optimal control during my masters, and uh, personally, I was feeling interested in uh, the interaction between agents that you can study, for example, in economics courses, not like game theory. And so, this led me to have a master thesis into stochastic differential games. I don't know if you ever heard of them. And then I used these. Uh, this thesis as part of my application process. 
So yeah, the main reason why I decided to apply for PhD was just like, I wanted to, to study more, you know? That's it, simple. Second question um, I've asked myself, I'm asking myself is, why have I applied to LSE, right? So to be fair, I didn't apply only to LSE, you know, uh, especially since uh, when you are applying, you don't know whether you get the chance to, you know, to receive an offer. You know, it's competitive, there are many students, so there are limited amount of professors. So I applied to several universities. I went for the law of large numbers, not like, I applied to many places in the, hopefully, you know, one, Will turn out to be a positive outcome. So, luckily enough, I got two and I, I chose to come at LSE. Uh, the reasons for this is because, uh, well, you know, LSE is quite a famous university, you know, it's a diverse, international, the professors here are well respected, and uh, moreover, there is a quite uh, you know, uh, important community of PhD students. Uh, we have here a lot of uh, PhD students, uh, and I think this is important uh, because uh, in the PhD process uh, you have uh, you, you do research, right? So it's not like you're going to to do something that's straightforward. So you're going to have ups and downs, and uh, you might want to share some ideas. And having a lot of uh, students to whom you can share the path, I think it's uh, it's very important. Um, then one thing that I found out later is that in LSC in the stats department you have you know, several uh, research groups uh, as uh, that we presented earlier. Almost personally in the probability in finance and insurance uh, research group and we were cooperating and working a lot with uh, the financial mathematics uh, group within the mathematics department. So each research group has many cooperations with uh, other departments research group, so uh, the way they uh, were introduced uh, earlier today, but it's not just going to be, you know, within your silo of a research group, and it's going to be, uh, you're going to be exposed with, uh, uh, to, to other PhD students from other departments. And on top of this, here, you know, we have the PhD Academy. Uh, the PhD Academy I think it's pretty cool because uh, well, it offers, first of all, a place where you can network with uh, other PhD students from other departments. And it also offers a lot of the, ch the chances for you know, self-development. They're organized together with networking events, uh, also some self-development courses about uh, whatever, you know, all aspects of uh, research life, self-development, soft skill, and, uh, and this kind of stuff. So yeah, I think you know it's a uh, it's good to apply to LSE because it provides an environment which is good. I found it very helpful to you know, pursue and enjoy my, my PhD. The third question I'm asking myself is uh, how you know, did I find the application process? Uh, the application process is never pleasant. I guess you can uh, you can agree with this. So it was a right. Um, at the end of the day, it was straightforward. You know, on the web page, they advise you to get in touch with professors beforehand. Although you can just simply apply. What I did do, I uh, was just simply apply. I didn't have a clue who would have been would have been the best supervisor based on the descriptions uh, and. Uh, not, what you can find online, so I was like, well, let's see. No, eventually, the vice supervisor would pick me. <laughs> and that was the case. I got lucky enough to be, to be chosen. No? So then I just simply applied. And later on, no, I discovered that a lot of colleagues actually uh, contacted their supervisors beforehand. So once they joined LSE, they already you know, knew their supervisor, had some chats, and even some had some face-to-face -face meetings. So and both ways can work. Probably, you know, as the web page advice, it's better to, to try and, uh, and see whether you want to work with some professor specifically beforehand. Otherwise, you can always give the go, apply the web page, and uh, let's see. Then, after uh, you know, I applied, I, you know, I had to prepare a research proposal, uh, which uh, 
you, you, know, you already discussed with me. So, I mean, it's not exactly what's going to be you know, your research topic or your PhD, not necessarily. In my case, I wrote a research proposal and then I did research on something, something different. So, I think this is mainly a, a tool that the professors are using to see what their interests uh, and uh, how you formulate. Uh, the research problem and how you think about uh, solving it. Yeah. And of course, they don't expect you to know how to, how to do this. Uh, so then after I completed my application, which was a research proposal and thesis, I, I waited and then I've got uh, an interview with my you know, eventual uh, supervisor. And that was it. No. In the end, it's straightforward. Not pleasant as any application, but um, what did I do um, for, for my PhD and how it was? Uh, so the PhD here at LSE is four years. The first year um, I spent most of the time uh, doing attending courses of classwork and uh, literature review. And in the first year, you know, uh, for what concerns the probability finance and insurance uh, research group, they advise us to attend courses from the London uh, Graduate School of Financial Mathematics, you know, which is uh, a school organized by the Department of Mathematics and Statistics of the University of London to offer more advanced uh, level courses to PhD students across London. So I was doing this, then uh, I literature review and I eventually formulated with my supervisor the first uh, uh, research uh, problem project we wanted to, to pursue. Now this turned out not to be successful so our second year uh, we call it a day said so this is not going to go anywhere and uh, I mean potentially you can also say I can spend all my PhD here and try to fix it but uh, you know, the, uh, the PhD you have to produce something you know, either published paper or something publishable. So it wasn't worth the wait and see. Uh, you know, it's important to, to cut it short and say fine. Uh, so of course this wasn't pleasant. Uh, but then you know, we started a new project and this went well. I published uh, the paper together with my supervisor. And thanks to this, you know, already during the second year, uh, we were having some preliminary results and this allowed me to We'll start uh, going around to seminars, conferences, present the work as a first as a poster, second as a short talk, you know, 10, 20 minutes, and then eventually a full uh, talk at conferences like uh, 45 minutes and stuff like that. So that was that was very good. Uh, was uh, especially since you know, when you go out and travel for, for conferences, you present your work, you have the chance to interact with uh, professors, fellow PhD students, they ask you questions, you think about you know, further about uh, what you've done, how you've done it, how could it have been done differently, or what could be further uh, research on the, on the paper. Then, uh, so the third year, you know, I was, it was probably the best year of my PhD, you know, like traveling around uh, the, the one paper was published and I was keep working on the, the second paper and everything was going uh, smoothly, I would say, up to well, the fourth year with that pandemic. You know, this was, uh, of course, uh, not the, the end I was expecting, of course, it caused some disruption as I guess it goes to you uh, when you were studying, you know, like no face-to-face -face meeting with the supervisor, of course, work got slower, but in the end, I continued, uh, you know, doing the work, uh, completing the second uh, paper and starting the third one. And uh, at the end of the year, I put them all together for what is the, the thesis. All this while uh, applying for jobs, because uh, uh, well, during the third year, I was traveling around, was um, like a the exercise, do I see myself? Uh, in, uh, in, in this world, or like I want to try something different. Well, and I said, okay, probably I want to try something else before making the definitive leap for what's going to be uh, my, my future. So I, thought, I was like, let's go and apply for jobs. 
So uh, I was applying for jobs, and uh, at the end of the, of the year, more or less while I, uh, I was writing up thesis, I started working part time for an insure tech startup here in London. And, and that was it. So then you, know, you submit the thesis, and you wait for uh, the call from the examiners, if any, and, uh, and that's it. So, um, good questions. Any tips you can give about studying a PhD? Well, here, uh, as I did study a PhD myself, I can give some tips. And uh, I think you know, good three tips are the, are the following. So the, the first one is you know, don't obsess yourself with continuous progress during research. You know, research is more like a jump process. So, you stay flat, nothing is moving, do a lot of work, but nothing is moving, and then at some point, boom, big leap forward, and uh, wow, well, it's all like this. So don't obsess yourself, it's just going to, to be negative, you're doing damage to yourself, and it's, it's not worth it. So you need to be patient and uh, keep going. Uh, at some point, something will show up, and uh, it's a bit like a lottery. Right? So, so that's the jump process, indeed. The second one is uh, to participate as much as possible in the department life, so from attending seminars, um, you know, going to the events organized by Penny, uh, go to conferences, uh, teach as well, because this is all, I think, uh, very helpful, and, um, and you know, this can lead you to, to further uh, things like you know, presenting your work, and uh, and this kind of stuff. Um, then finally, uh, that it's cool. It's good to enjoy the day-to-day -day research. You know, trying to solve the problem, be uh, enthusiastic about uh, you know, solving it, but be forward-looking. You know, because the PhD is lasting only four years, and at some point you have to make a call. So it, it, it's good to you know. To focus on your day-to-day -day problems and tasks, but you no, know, we look forward. Like, put yourself in condition to 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 have to get to gather the data you need to decide later. So for example, if you think you are, uh, you know, you want to pursue a career in academia, you no, know, go to conferences, put yourself out there, uh, try to be uh, talking to professors you would like to work with. Uh, other PhD students, postdocs, try to, to build your own network based on, on your interest. And especially if you go to conferences, you can hear how other people work, what are the trends, and, and I think this is important. Or otherwise, if you instead uh, think you're more you know, uh, leaning towards industry, try to get a, an internship, because eventually if you get an internship early enough, you might have uh, one of the research projects you pursue, which is inspired by some industry application, and this can turn out to be pretty helpful when you apply for jobs, or you, know, you are uh, reached out from by headhunters you know, to, to get into some industry positions. So these are my, my tips. When did I start thinking about my career? So, and now I found, I found my first PhD job. So when I, uh, when I started my PhD, I wasn't really thinking about my career that much. You know, as I was saying earlier, it was just about I want to study more. Uh, it's not enough what I, I know. And that's it. So I started thinking about my career more during the third year. You know, like research was going well. I felt like, okay, fine, my PhD. Somehow, you know, I, I should get it. <laughs> so I, I can start looking more confidently to my future. And I started thinking about uh, my career. So I had, a, for example, a chat with my supervisor about what do you think if I do an internship right now? Well, he recommended not to because, you know, as the first year, I wasn't really lucky. You know, we kind of still had to do some work in order to, to build a strong thesis that could, uh, could, uh, could do for, for the PhD. So I didn't do any internship during my third year. I started applying during the fourth, and as I said, you know, I started working for an insurance startup 
uh, during the fourth year. So how the transition was, uh, it was it was fine. It was um, interesting to see the change. You know, like PhD, as I was saying, you know, it's a jump process. You know, with a, you know, a lot of like you have big jumps, but not necessarily frequent. Uh, whereas I found that, in, especially in my experience, where I was uh, doing research and development of uh, parametric insurance solutions, it was you know, maybe you know, uh, smaller jumps, but more frequent. So it's kind of maybe easier to, uh, to deal with as you don't need to be as much patient as uh, uh, when you do research. So you know, I felt well prepared. Of course, the you know, PhD gives you a good foundation, makes you an independent thinker. You know, it allows you not to sort of organize yourself, your time. Um, it gives you a lot of, of skills that are useful when you later on uh, are working. Only thing is, as my PhD was pretty much theoretical, I was uh, rusty with uh, tasks like uh, data manipulation, Coding, but then you, you pick them up. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that, that was it on the, about my uh, first, uh, first job. Uh, what am I doing now? So, as I said, I graduated uh, during uh, 2021. I started working in 2020, and this year, I, in April, I changed job. So now I'm working as a quantitative analyst uh, for rates in the model of review and governance team in Jeff Morgan. And uh, my, my tasks are mainly uh, to you know, review and validate the models the traders are using while they trade. So, and uh, how does this work? You know, there are some models uh, probably you, you heard of uh, that uh, traders are using to you know, the price uh, instruments, the derivatives to manage the risks. And uh, what we do is we, uh, we we think about what can be the limitations. As often, the, these models have some important limitations for the sake of practicalities, and we need to carefully assess which these these limitations are and quantify them so that uh, uh, you know, the risk uh, that comes out of uh, using this model is, uh, is at least known. No, especially sometimes there can be losses uh, because models are not uh, handled as they should be or they're used for something that they are not really uh, calibrated for. Um, So final final question. Uh, does my PhD have any connection to my job, or has it had any uh, indirect impact on my career? So as I said my PhD was mainly theoretical. It was uh, I was doing stochastic differential games with impulse controls, uh, so really no applications. Uh, I mean you, you potentially do, but it's not for people applying practice uh, in industry and stuff like that. Um, so, apart from the basics, you know, what you're using for research and for working, uh, well, there's not much, but then, of course, both have a foundation of stochastic calculus, probability, so of course not well. What I learned and used for my PhD, I can use for work, although it's not exactly the same stuff, but there is, uh, so some intersection uh, there. Other than that, as I was saying before, I, I feel like the PhD helped me helps me a lot in being you know, independent, proactive, trying to uh, you know, think about how things can be done better. And especially, I think this more or less in every job you have to you have to read papers, documentations, whatever. And uh, as a part of the PhD, you have to do literature review, read papers, read papers uh, to understand how they eventually solve problems so that you can potentially replicate similar arguments and stuff. And uh, so this 
maybe a lot better than I was in reading papers, understanding them, and especially reading them in a challenging way. Because you're not just supposed to read, to read and believe. You know? But sometimes, often, I mean, there can be mistakes or so I think it's good to, to learn how to read things in a, in a challenging way, not just uh, taking things uh, and assuming it's, uh, it, uh, it's the way it is. And uh, well, for example, in, in my previous job, uh, this was uh, helping me um, uh, doing research and development of uh, parametric insurance solutions. So uh, I... Uh, I did research and produced uh, some insurance product on uh, hurricanes, um, uh, excessive food consumption due to bad weather for the carriers or the nighttime industry, or even uh, shootings against shootings in some uh, states in the US. Uh, and of course, you have to, to do research uh, for, for this because there is no solution. There, there is not necessarily any product there, or even if there is, is private property, and so you have to come up with a, with your own way of thinking about how to do this. Of course, you help yourself with the literature and stuff, but that's exactly how you more or less work with the PhD. So you don't uh, start with your uh, research project uh, out of nowhere. You do some literature review, you think where there could be a gap, and in fact, you can make, and you, you start uh, working on it. For now, this helps me because uh, now we have these uh, quantitative models used for trading. We need to make tests. We need to understand the limitations. But of course, the, no one is telling me beforehand which are the limitations. So you need to, to read critically and figure out where can the problem arise and eventually how to measure if the problem is not important, not so important, or irrelevant. Because according to this, then the bank will decide uh, how many people will be, will be working on it. Not so. This is all stuff that, they, that it's uh, very useful regardless of uh, industry or academia. So to close it, I will definitely do my PhD again. <laughs> That's all. Any questions? Yes. In Govan, uh, again, would you uh, like focus your research topic more on something like applied or with an eye on something applied if you had to do it again? Yeah, so this is a good question. I enjoyed very much doing the way I did. Uh, but maybe, yeah, like if there is something I can uh, maybe have some doubt about, did I have done this differently, is to try maybe and be in a way less naive and uh, not maybe try to uh, to get in touch with some you know, PhD that went to work or some people in industry maybe try to do uh, an internship but yeah anyway you know, the thing is everyone is doing his own uh, path uh, even if you are let's say not so so fast, you know, in deciding where you want to be. I mean, you still have uh, a lifetime afterwards. So, for example, in my case, you know, what, what, um, what I'm, I'm going to do is, uh, I don't even know whether maybe in, uh, in a couple of years I will be able to try and go back to academia. So, for example, my experience is I felt like you know, this is a lot of uh, knowledge and theory, but how is this stuff useful for something? You know, how is this stuff used? So that's the, in order to also be passionate about uh, you know, teaching and, and uh, coming up with uh, research problems, I felt that first I need to see how things are, are used, and then eventually I can come up with, uh, with some uh, research project of my own. So for example, on the side as a hobby, I'm still working at, uh, at, my, at my papers, so it's not... So uh, I think, answering to your questions, yeah, maybe uh, it would have been good for my short-term career, well, for example, you know, maybe you can uh, get a better job, you can earn 
uh, more money, whatever. Yeah, but it, it's all dependent on you know, how you are living the, the experience. But you know, as I was saying during the talk, I encourage you to to try not to wait the fourth year to, to move. Of course, it's good to, to try and have a constructive relationship with supervisors. In, in my case, I wished uh, to maybe start doing something during the third year, uh, but he suggested not to, and I listened. No, I trusted him, and uh, I think it was, it was good. Because anyway, you don't want to stress yourself too much. You know, you, you're doing the PhD only once. Well, I mean, we can potentially do PhD times in different subject, but um, I think on average we do it only once and it's also good to, to enjoy it and, uh, and not put too much pressure on yourself in the future because uh, you know, very new to pandemic, it's a, it's a bit random, you know, we can be, no, there was the pandemic and I was applying for jobs and there was no jobs. <laughs> so the, it felt like everyone was looking at all of a sudden back to senior, they were going Junior, 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 and then no old senior. So, <laughs> you don't know. Anyway, good question. So, someone else? Mm. Would you say that doing a PhD has changed you a lot in terms of how you think about attacking a problem, how you uh, organize your time with, with respect to work, and also how you stay self motivated? With yeah, so. It's kind of like a job, so you, you learn a lot, and uh, maybe compared to no, now, now I'm in, in the industry, so I see how uh, people that are coming out of the masters uh, are treated, right? So I can make a fair, fair comparison between you know, what was my path, and uh, the first thing I can say for sure is as a PhD student, on average, depending on your supervisor, you're left more alone than you would be if you are in a company. So for example, oftentimes we hear you no know, problems of micromanagement in industry and PhD, I mean, there can be some supervisors that like to micromanage, but uh, I think you know, supervisors have also you know, to teach, to do the research project, they're co-authors, so I think the micromanaging that you, you, you have in academia is still less than the one you have in industry. And anyway, you're more alone because yes, yeah, so okay, you might have your, your supervisor asking for progress or where you're at, but then between the, the meeting and the following, then you're alone uh, with your, your problem. So, and then, you know, uh, especially if you agree some deadlines with your supervisor, then it's on, on you how you're going to meet them. Meet them. And uh, so, in this, I I think the PhD was was very useful. And um, so you were saying, uh, like, so this was on the independence, but then you were saying something else about the staying self motivated. Because it's a long project, you and yeah. I mean, this is this is on you. Uh, I I don't know. I I am self motivated. I can be. Let's say I have sometimes meeting once a month with my supervisor, depending on the on the stage of the research project, and it wasn't a problem. I also know that there are some other colleagues that prefer to have a way more frequent uh, because otherwise they feel like. Uh, no, why should I do this? <laughs> I know it's kind of natural. I think even maybe that's when I was saying that she was liking to have uh, no, frequent meetings. Uh, this is up to you. I, I think maybe if you, you find out that uh, the way of working with the supervisor is not optimal for you, you can discuss and see. Like, I don't know, if you have fortnightly meetings, you can ask maybe, can we have a uh, also, a lunch together <laughs> to, 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 to discuss something. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's good to, to try and uh, talk you know, with your supervisor uh, and see yeah, what's I, the best. Uh, yeah. I, I feel like the reason why I also about motivation is many of us here who have never done PhD, we've done project work in our courses, but much shorter duration. And even then, at some point, you know, when you get towards a certain stage, there's like 
the motivation goes down, but you have to like keep pushing. I imagine it's ten times. It can be ten times worse for when you have longer projects. It can be great. You know, if it is months, you are trying to solve a problem, and <laughs> then it's draining. Right? It's exhausting. But that's why I think it's good to don't make an effort to not being obsessed. It's easy to become obsessed with problems. <laughs> it's very easy. But I think it's good to try and not to be. So to, for example, no, in my case, uh, I was, it was useful to do sport you know, as a so to, to manage uh, the, the time so that you so that you're okay. No, no, it's enough. Especially sometimes you, know, you it happens several times to me that I was like, no, today's the day I'm going to, to to solve this issue right now. Then I was spending you know, from the morning until 8 p.m. maybe later and nothing. Then I was going home, coming back in the morning, was oh, stupid, easy. Yeah. So sometimes getting obsessed and just staying there and like now is not it doesn't help. So it's good to be uh, you know some motivated, but you shouldn't. Past the threshold of being obsessed because at some point it becomes counterproductive. Yeah. You're being harsh on yourself. Sorry? And you're also being harsh on yourself. Yeah, yeah. So, PhD is, is good because uh, you, know, you can learn how to cope with this kind of stuff maybe in a faster way than if you're, if you're working in, a, in industry. Because uh, Kind of like you're, it's you make the problem, and uh, then yeah, okay, supervisor, okay, you have some fellow PhD students in the, in the room. But I don't know. I feel it's um, it's different to the work I'm doing currently. You know, I, like the interactions I have with my uh, manager now are more frequent. Um, also because they you know, they have a way to track progress, which is different. And uh, of course, these is uh, in a way helpful you know, in, the, in the sense that you don't know, need to all right, plan too much beforehand how you're going to manage yourself and uh, how you're going to make the algorithm to solve your maybe your, your project so, uh, because this is kind of going to come up from the manager either as a issue tells you or you discuss it and then it's coming out of the discussion so I think a PhD is definitely good for both academia and industry. Probably if you want something fast in industry, maybe better to go and work. Because I mean, in the end, when you spend four years, then you more or less start at the same level as masters. So, and uh, uh, personally, when you do apply for jobs, the questions you ask are the same. If you're a master or PhD, but as a, as a master's, you're kind of fresh. You know, you, you've just done the, the coursework, the, the exams, and the way um, faster in getting to, to use the stuff that a PhD that's been spending four years on some niche uh, uh, project and uh, doesn't necessarily have the same. Yeah. But if, if you go deep in the research project, there is no competition, but they don't ask you about the research project. I mean, unless you. You were very forward looking and you precisely did a, a you know, research project that uh, companies like uh, you know, DeepMind or Hedge Fund yeah, like can like. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, they take you. But you need to be very forward looking. And it's difficult. I mean, at my age, I had no clue. I mean, when I was at your age, I had no clue. I was like, sounds all so cool. I want to know more and we'll see. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Question? No? Anyway, in case uh, you have uh, you're coming up with questions later, uh, you can uh, find me online. Uh, am I still Penny and the. Uh, you're still fellow, yeah. Yeah. And, and anyway, in LinkedIn, uh, do we have uh, the past PhDs in there? Yeah, we have it. So you can find my name there. I mean, my name is also on the page for today, so LinkedIn, it's, uh, it's easy. <laughs> You can drop me a message and I'm happy to reply.